Hey everybody, welcome, welcome, welcome. I am so glad to be here with all of you. Uh, it should be a fun late night conversation tonight. So hit the like button, hit the subscribe button, hit the notifications bell. We are streaming on Facebook, we are streaming on YouTube, and we are about to be streaming on Rockfin. Let's do it. The American century. I say that the century on which we are entering can be and must be the century of the common man. A radical redistribution of economic power. I mean, we know that racism is just it's, it's a byproduct of capitalism. Everything would be all right if everything was put back in the hands of the people. We need a government that will make sure Americans are taken care of and organize the economy to serve the people, not the profits of a wealthy few. We now have the techniques and the resources to get rid of poverty. We got to start getting out there with the people. Get out of the movement and get to the masses. We need a government of action. Welcome, 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 everybody. So glad to be here with all of you. Hit the like button, hit the subscribe button, hit the notifications bell, tweet this out, invite all your friends to join. Let's have another late night amazing conversation. Now, big important announcement before we get going here. If you haven't already watched, go and watch the amazing documentary that Peter Coffin made about our Center for Political Innovation Conference that we just had in uh, in DC. This documentary that Peter Coffin made showing you the behind the scenes work, everyone who sees it loves it. Peter Coffin is an amazingly skilled, amazingly skilled filmmaker. And uh, this documentary, a lot of people just love it. It's, uh, it's almost an hour long, about 54 minutes, 51 minutes. And it gives you just a sense of how we do our conferences, a behind the scenes look at the Center for Political Innovation and all the people who came together. You get to hear intimate, up close remarks from Jyoti Brar, from Lumpia Logic, from, oh man, from Elizabeth Young, the president of CPI, from Peter Coffin, uh, from so many people that are just a beloved part of our community. You also, you get to see, you know, Garland Nixon, you get to see Scott Ritter, you get to see Dr. Wilmer Leon. So many great people are in this lovely film. It's really, really awesome. Uh, so if you haven't had a chance to watch, go go and watch it. Um, it premiered this afternoon. It was really, really spectacular. And people love it. I mean, people people really love it. Uh, you know, all the feedback is very positive. Peter Coffin is very, very good at what he does. And it really gives a humanizing behind the scenes image of the Center for Political Innovation. There's some politics in it, but there's also some humor in it. There's some, you know, some kind of intimate, intimate connections between people. It's just really something special. I can't describe it, really. This film that Peter Coffin made is phenomenal. It is absolutely phenomenal. It is, it is now on the Center for Political Innovation YouTube channel. So go and watch it. And after you watch it, go and send it to your friends, go and send it to your relatives. Uh, it really shows that that conference we did in Washington, D.C. Uh, was really important. Um, and we brought together a lot of people and go and watch the the Summit Against Hypocrisy documentary. Link is down below. It's the first link in the description. And it's also in the chat. I just dropped it in there. Can't watch it now because you're watching this. Go and save the link and watch it later. You won't regret it. And you want to show this film to everybody. Uh, you want to show people what we were about. People have been joining the Center for Political Innovation after watching the film. Uh, there was uh, there's somebody, I, I guess I, I won't give away information, but there was somebody in one state who joined. There's somebody somewhere else who joined. People are joining now after watching this film because they really understand the value of having a community like the Center for Political Innovation. Um, and, you know, and they, they understand the importance of being involved with the work that we are doing. So uh, I just want to make sure that you do not miss this documentary. Do not miss it. Do not miss it. Now, today, um, I also want to mention real quick before we get going here, I had the honor of being an invited guest along with John McCarthy, uh, of our community at the Yahuru movement, uh, their uh, their call 
uh, to raise awareness about the indictments that they are facing, the hands-off Uhuru, Uhuru national call. I gave a message on behalf of the Center for Political Innovation, and John McCarthy also gave a message. The two of us gave very important messages of solidarity. We were there along with uh, you know KPFK radio hosts, uh, along with uh, activists, uh, you know Ralph Pointer. Uh, and, you know, and others uh, in New York City, along with the Freedom Road Socialist Organization and other civil liberties activists, uh, was very important. And that situation we are paying close attention to, close, close attention to. And I'm writing the super chat down because that's the way we roll. Um, but yeah, so I just wanted to make those two announcements before we got going here. Um, go and watch Peter Coffin's documentary. We were really honored to participate uh, in the uh, in the hands off Uhuru call today to support the Uhuru movement. Um, so there you go. And that brings me to um, the way we do things here. Just for those of you who may not be familiar with our style here, the way we do things is I give my opening remarks. That's what I'm doing now. I just kind of tell you what's on my mind, uh, what I've got prepared. I give my opening remarks. And then from there, I do the roll call where we find out who is watching. I call you all out as I see you, names and locations, names and locations. We find out who it is on the other side of the camera who's watching. Uh, it's always a great, great diverse crew of people from all over the world and all over the United States in particular. It's always really, really awesome. And then from there, I answer super chat questions for the rest of the night. And the last two nights, you guys have been on fire, shooting me good questions, and I've been answering them, and we've had full-on shows, and that's been great. And we have our first super chat question already from Chris, wrote it down, and I will be writing them down throughout the first half of the show. And then, then when the second half of the show rolls around, I answer super chat questions for the rest of the night. And you all make the second half of the show happen. And here we got another one. What about the gray book on austerity behind you? What about the gray book on austerity behind you? Wrote it down, wrote it down, wrote it down, wrote it down. Um, you know, so that's the way we do things here. And you guys really make the second half of the show what it is by just asking me questions, getting me talking, getting me commenting on stuff that you want to hear about. The second half of the show is really up to you guys, the live audience. You make it happen with your questions, uh, with your comments, uh, with your opinions, with your jokes, with your witticisms. Uh, you guys make the second half of the show happen. So I'm asking you to go ahead and do it. Give me something to talk about. In the second half of our show, pitch me a softball that I can hit it out of the park. Uh, you know, hit me, shoot me a curveball and see how I'll react. That's what people love about the second half of our show. Nobody else does this, right? I get on here, I give my opening remarks, and then on the second half of the show, uh, I just kind of react to all of you. And it's very spontaneous and it's very natural. And my personality comes across, and you guys, and we're all playing off of each other. You know, this wouldn't be the same if I was just sitting in front of a camera recording this and then posting it afterwards, it wouldn't be the same. It is the live audience, the 100 to 200 to sometimes 300 people that watch this live while I'm on here uh, that makes this show what it is. Now, not everyone can watch live. There's probably people watching this right now. Uh, who are watching it on their way to work or on their way to church tomorrow morning or while they're taking a shower in the morning tomorrow or while they're while they're getting up three days from now or while they're cleaning their bedroom a week from now or whatever. And I don't care when you watch it, right? Uh, it's usually between one and 2,000 people watch every single one of these streams. One and 2,000 people watch every single one of these conversations. That's how many unique views we have. You are part of a special community here. You are part of a special community here if you are if you're watching this. However, I will add and let me add that those of you who are watching this live are the special special part of the community because you have the privilege of helping determine how the second half of our show goes. All the people that watch this afterwards, they missed the boat. They just have to listen to me answer whatever questions I got asked. But those of you who are here right now, you guys have a special opportunity. And that special opportunity is to set the tone for the show. 
That's what you guys get to do. It, it's it's really a special opportunity. And the other the other 1,800 people who watch this don't have anywhere near the opportunity that you have right now. So take advantage of your opportunity. Hit me with your best shot. Hit me with your best shot. And we'll do it. And we'll have an amazing second half of our show tonight. Another super chat question. Writing it down. So there you go. There you go. We are already on our way to an amazing second half of the program. Keep the super chats rolling in. And now I will give my opening remarks. My opening remarks tonight are something that I started thinking about earlier today. Earlier today, Peter Coffin and I, we decided to stream to plug the upcoming documentary. And some of the stuff that Peter Coffin and I talked about got me thinking. It got me thinking. It got me thinking. A lot of what we do here on these streams is very special because we put things in context. The tradition of Marxism that I come from taught that the duty of a Marxist speaker or writer in any particular circumstance is to do three things. To tell you what's happening, to tell you why it is happening, and to tell you what to do about it. That if you are a Marxist, your job is to tell what is happening in the world, highlighting the events that get ignored in the mainstream press, get ignored in the mainstream analysis, things that people may not be aware of. But then use scientific, Marxist economics, dialectical and historical materialism to explain why it's happening. But that is not enough. From there, you then have to explain what to do about it. How can we intervene in history to make things better? And that that is the thrust of doing your job. And that one thing And that one thing that you should always avoid is lazy analysis. Mao Zedong wrote an essay, Avoid Stereotyped Party Writing. And you never want to sound like you're giving answer 27B or answer 14A or answer 32C. You never want to sound like a computer. You never want to sound programmed. And then if you look at bad Marxist analysis, no need to name any names, so you've probably seen it. And a lot of the communist groups, after something happens, it is almost like they have an artificial intelligence bot that spits out their response. Homeless man is killed in the New York City subway. And it's almost like they have an artificial intelligence bot that goes, America is a racist country. Conservatives are right-wing and racist. Therefore, we must rally against Donald Trump and the police. Black Lives Matter. You know, that's lazy. The Pope of the Catholic Church 
He makes some kind of radical statement about world events. <laughs> the Roman Catholic Church is an institution set up in feudalism to oppress the working class. Therefore, it is necessary to expose the Catholic Church as not a friend of the working class. And it, a lot of that goes on. It's this mechanical, automatic response. Something happens and like a like an artificial intelligence bot, like a machine, the so-called Marxist and analyzers, they don't teach you anything you didn't know. They just recite a position at you in response to it. And that is not helpful. It is not helpful because, number one, in order to act that way, they're not really engaging with events. If you're really engaging with events, you're not going to analyze it the same way you've analyzed other events. Because every event is unique. There are no two events that are exactly alike. Um, there are no two events that are exactly alike. The context of every event is vitally important to understanding every event. And the world around every event has a huge impact on it. Plus, the ability of the audience to intervene in different events requires a level of creativity. You have to know what you're capable of doing on the one hand. You have to know what you're capable of doing in terms of intervention. You have to plan a realistic intervention consistent with your own strength. You have to think of a way of intervening that will be effective and creative. You have to be able to predict what the response to your intervention will be. None of this is the kind of thing that can be done by an artificial intelligence bot. We must avoid stereotyped party writing. And the tradition that I come from says you tell people what's happening, but you give them the version of events that's very different than the ruling class and their version of events. Number two, you tell them why it's happening using Marxist materialism and economics. And then number three, you determine what we can do about it. This is a challenge. This is different than socialist education where you might be teaching history or teaching basic Marxist concepts. This is different. This is, this is the kind of analysis that it is necessary for a Marxist to engage in. So what I'm going to do tonight, I am going to talk about how we got into the world situation that we are in. I am going to talk about how we got in to the situation that we are in by going from the 1990s up to today. Because I, I was born in 1987. That is the year that I was born, and I lived through all of this. But I did not know what was going on while I was living through it. And I became much more politically engaged around 2004, 2006, when I was a high, late high school student. I got very politically engaged 2007, 2008. I've been, I've been very politically engaged since that time. But it's taken me a long time to piece together the many different reasons that things were happening and how they got us into the situation that we are currently in. I tell people that 1999 was a pivotal year 
in the history of the world. It was the year of a turning point. Ten years prior, 1989, that was the year that the fall of socialism in the Eastern Bloc and the fall of the Soviet Union really escalated. 1989 was the year that the government of East Germany fell. That was the year that the government of Czechoslovakia fell. The government of Romania fell. 1989, government after government in the Eastern Bloc was falling. And it picked up with a heavy pace. There was an attempted counter-revolution in China. The Tiananmen events, power of the Chinese Communist Party, managed to pull through it. But all across Eastern Europe, the various communist governments were falling. A couple years later, the Soviet Union itself fell. And after the fall of the Soviet Union, there was a huge escalation in what is rightly called austerity. The welfare state was cut. Living standards across the planet started to drop. In the United States, Bill Clinton came into office and he brought in NAFTA, the North American Free Trade Agreement that devastated American industries. It also caused American agribusiness to just destroy Mexico. Just Mexican farmers were completely put out of business, destroyed Haiti economically. In Bolivia, they privatized the water. People in Bolivia could be arrested for collecting water on their rooftop because they were stealing water from Nestle or Coca-Cola, an American corporation. Bolivia sold its country off to the highest bidder. And in the countries where socialism and Marxism and communism was overthrown, it was economic devastation. U.S. economist Andre Gunder Frank called it economic genocide. The Yeltsin administration just ripped Russia to shreds economically. The farms were closing down. The factories were closing down. 30% unemployment in Russia during those years. The population was drastically falling. Living standards were drastically declining in the former Soviet Union. Huge rise in heroin addiction and drug gangs, huge rise in human trafficking was devastating. The fall of the Soviet Union was, was a huge defeat for the international working class. In the United States, we had Bill Clinton, got rid of welfare as we know it, resulted in a lot of cuts to working families. In Britain, you had Tony Blair. Tony Blair was from the New Labour faction, the faction of the Labour Party that said capitalism was just the natural way, that got rid of Clause 4 in the Labour Party's constitution, said that the Labour Party believed in socialism, which just meant a good economy for everyone. They no longer believed in class struggle. Um, and all over the world, all over the world, you saw just an assault on the international working class. And there were three countries that remained very serious strongholds of revolutionary anti-imperialism. It's interesting. You know, China at that point was very much seeking foreign investment from the United States. Vietnam was very much seeking foreign investment from the United States. Laos, the, the Lao People's Republic, was also seeking foreign investment from the United States. Nicaragua uh, had an election in which the, the Sandinistas, the Revolutionary Party, were voted out of office um, and the counter-revolutionaries took power. But there were three countries that held on to their revolutionary anti-imperialist ideology. In Iran, it wasn't Iran. In Iran, the, the hardliners and the, the leaders of the Islamic Revolution you know, were kind of pushed, pushed to the side and moderates and reformists came into office. 
But there were three countries where revolutionary leaders who came out of struggles to defeat American imperialism, who had mobilized the population to drive out the imperialists, three countries existed. And those three countries were Cuba, North Korea, and Iraq. Iraq was led by the Ba'athist Arab Socialist Party under the leadership of Saddam Hussein. North Korea was led by the Korean Workers' Party, the Communist Party that had led the northern half of the Korean Peninsula since the end of the Second World War. Cuba was led by Fidel Castro and the Cuban Communist Party. Those three countries, despite the fall of the Soviet Union, despite everything, they were adamant that they were not abandoning their principles. And the United States attacked all three of those countries viciously. I would say North Korea was probably the, the country that suffered the most during the 1990s. Because North Korea is mainly a mountainous country. It's, a main, it's the mountainous half of the Korean Peninsula. Korea is one country, but the, nor the northern half of the Korean Peninsula is the mountainous part. And there's not much arable land. And so North Korea worked very, very hard to build up its agricultural system despite that. But they had one weakness, which was that they needed oil. They needed oil. And with the fall of the Soviet Union, the petrodollar had dominance. You could only buy oil with U.S. dollars. And the sanctions that the United States put on North Korea made it impossible for North Korea to have any dollars. And as a result of that, North Korea's food system came to a grinding halt. And millions of people in North Korea died from malnutrition because of what the United States did to North Korea in the 1990s. It devastated North Korea economically. There was a food crisis. People were starving to death. And any other government in the world would have collapsed under those circumstances. But North Korea, despite a horrendous food crisis, was able to hold on to power and hold the country together, which is nothing short of a miracle. We cannot imagine what our North Korean comrades were facing during those years. They were just devastated. Cuba also suffered horrendously during those years. Their ability to even have electricity was limited. Cuba's economy had largely depended on exporting sugar, selling sugar to the Soviet Union. And the Soviet Union was gone. And the USA had insane stringent sanctions on Cuba. So Cuba suddenly had loads of sugar it could not sell. Cuba couldn't sell its sugar to anybody. And as a result, people who go, went to Cuba in the 90s talked about how the lights went off. You'd only have electricity for maybe three or four hours a day. Now, there were food shortages. There was no malnutrition. People weren't starving to death, but there were shortages of food and consumer goods. It was a bad time in Cuba. They called it the special period because the economy was so badly hurt. And in Iraq, the United States put insane sanctions on Iraq. It wouldn't allow Iraq to import chlorine. Chlorine is necessary to purify water. But they said that chlorine could be used as a chemical weapon. So because of that, Iraq was not allowed to have water to purify or to, to purify its water. It wasn't allowed to have chlorine to purify its water. Horrendous. And as a result of that, many, many people in Iraq died. The official estimate of the deaths as a result of the U.S. crippling economic sanctions that banned the importing of medicine, banned the importing of chlorine, banned the importing of all kinds of products into Iraq. The ultimate result of that was, people say, about 1.2 million people dying, 500,000 children under the age of 12 dying. It was horrendous what was done. These were three countries that were at odds with the United States. They were three countries that had been aligned with the Soviet Union against U.S. imperialism. The Soviet Union fell, and they refused they refused to back down, and because Wall Street suddenly had a monopoly, 
because there wasn't a big force of opposition to U.S. imperialism on the global stage, these three countries were just pounded economically. Cuba was pounded economically. North Korea was pounded economically. Iraq was pounded economically. People died. People died in North Korea. People died in, in Iraq. I don't know exactly what the results were in Cuba. People weren't like literally starving to death, but it was bad in Cuba. It was very, very bad in Cuba. And the USA was determined that it was just going to smoke them out. It was going to just starve out these countries and defeat these three countries that were considered to be bastions of resistance to Western capitalism and imperialism. And throughout the rest of the world, as I said, it was the march of austerity. The International Monetary Fund, the IMF, would go to countries in the developing world and give them development loans. You'd go to countries like Venezuela and it would say, all right, in order to make your country wealthier, you're a third world country, we're going to give you a, a development loan. But in order to get your loan, you have to do what we say. We, you, we have to manage your economy. You, we have to follow, we you have to follow what we say. So they'd give them a loan. And they come back the next year for the next loan and they'd say, okay, now uh, you spend way too much money on your public sector. You need to cut the government budget. And so they would lay off a bunch of workers in the sanitation sector. And people in neighborhoods in Caracas and other Venezuelan cities wouldn't get their garbage picked up because they didn't have enough sanitation workers because they had to lay people off. And then they'd come back the next year and they'd say, oh, you still spend way too much money on maintaining your power plants, maintaining your electrical facilities. So then they would have to lay off a bunch of government workers in the power plants. And then working class neighborhoods in Venezuela would, would not have electricity. The electricity wouldn't get repaired for weeks. And then they'd say, you're spending way too much money maintaining your roads. The roads you've got, they're just, they're too, they're too well maintained. So then they'd have to lay off, lay off workers and let their roads go into disrepair. The country of Ecuador, which was undergoing IMF adjustment loans, development loans, they were told, you know, you have your own currency there in Ecuador. Yeah, you can't do that anymore. That's too independent. Get rid of your own currency. You will adopt the U.S. dollar as your currency. The international bankers forced Ecuador to give up its own currency and adopt the U.S. dollar. They lost their own currency. And that was not good for the economy at all. Right? These were bad times. These were bad, bad times. And Cuba was devastated economically. But Cuba was a center of the communist movement of South and Central America. You know, if you go to any part of South and Central America in those years, and any working class neighborhood, Che Guevara, his face was painted on murals. Uh, people in the countryside and in the working class areas admired Che Guevara and Fidel Castro. Communism and Marxism was respected among the working class of so many regions in South and Centra, Central America. And Cuba started sponsoring conferences, gathering labor union activists, college professors and academics, revolutionaries, priests, all kinds of people, gathering them in Cuba to discuss a new strategy. And it was in Cuba that people started pushing and popularizing the term neoliberalism, which is very interesting. The Cubans go back to 1992, 1993, they started orienting leftists and activists around the world to start talking about neoliberalism and the need to fight against neoliberal economics. And they started having economics conferences in Cuba. There's a professor that I know, a Marxist professor that I know, won't say his name, very 
prominent economics professor, Ivy League, and he got invited to go to these conferences in Cuba. And this was in the 1990s. And when he was at the airport, he would you couldn't fly directly to Cuba. He would fly to Canada and then from there fly to Cuba. When he would be at the airport to fly to Canada, the FBI would be standing there with their badges. And they'd say, sir, we understand you're planning to go to Cuba. If you go to this conference in Cuba, we will charge you with violation of U.S. section blah, 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 blah. You will be arrested immediately after you return. And he would say, well, I talked to my attorneys. I'm prepared for that to happen. And he would get on the plane. And when he got back, they never charged him. Never charged him. But the FBI would try to intimidate him out of going to these conferences in Cuba. But co Cuba had conferences of communists and activists and progressives from all over the world, especially all over South and Central America, to talk about fighting neoliberalism. And it is in Cuba, at these important conferences, with a lot of different forces, not all of them traditional communists, anarchists were there. Social Democrats were there, conservative priests and nuns. It was, it was a wide variety of people would gather at these conferences to discuss how to fight austerity. And Fidel Castro said, we need Cuba to be at the center of the resistance to austerity and neoliberalism. It was there that the strategy of Bolivarian socialism was developed. And the communists shifted their tactics Instead of fighting in the countryside and trying to wage guerrilla warfare, they positioned themselves at the center of class collaborationist united fronts, popular fronts against austerity and cutbacks. They aligned themselves with the national bourgeoisie of their respective countries. They didn't want socialism, but also did not want cuts and austerity, didn't want the economy of their domestic country to be to be just completely handed over to Wall Street and American companies. And with a class collaborationist united front, a popular front with the national bourgeoisie and the labor unions and the middle class and the academics and the professors and all kinds of different forces, they started gradually to build united fronts. And I said 1999 was a pivotal year because 1999 is the year the first president of a country who came out of these popular front Bolivarian movements was elected. His name was Hugo Chavez. Hugo Chavez got elected. And when he first got elected, he said, I don't believe in capitalism or socialism. I just believe in what is best for Venezuela. My hero is Simon Bolivar, uh, the liberator who drove out the Spanish colonizers. And I am elected and I'm going to end the austerity. I'm going to end the cutbacks and I'm going to do what's best for Venezuela. 1999. 1999 was also the year that in Russia, after so much devastation during the Yeltsin years, so much economic devastation and impoverishment, they elected a president who came in on a platform of saying he was going to fix the economy. And he was going to fix the economy by using Russia's oil and Russia's natural gas to stabilize the economy. He had written his academic thesis about how to use oil and gas to stabilize Russia's economy. He'd written about it, he'd gotten his PhD in economic planning, and he came into office and he said, I am going to use oil and gas to stabilize the economy of Russia. That was Vladimir Putin. 1999 was the year that the USA bombed Serbia, claiming there was genocide being committed against ethnic Albanians in Kosovo. And there was a whole hysterical campaign on television saying, oh my God, it's a new Holocaust. There's concentration camps being created. Now we find out that was fake news. The UN has admitted Milosevic did not commit genocide in Serbia. There were atrocities committed, just like there were atrocities committed by the Kosovo Liberation Army, but, but Milosevic was not committing genocide against ethnic Albanians. It was a lie used to justify bombing. And 1999 was also the year that the Chinese government started censoring the internet. And the reason that they started censoring the internet was because the 
internet was a new invention back then. And the Falun Gong religious cult, which was against the Chinese Communist Party, which is backed by the United States, the people who now run the Epoch Times, were using the internet to stage destabilizations of China, to shut down cities, to block intersections, to attack government officials, to to do all kinds of bad things. They were using the internet with the sponsorship of American intelligence. And so China said, okay, we're going to have to start censoring the internet now. China started censoring the internet in response to the USA using the Falun Gong religious cult to try and destabilize China. 1999 was kind of a pivotal year. 1999 is the year the Asian markets crashed. All of these Asian tiger countries that the USA had built up as a barrier against communism during the Cold War, Singapore, Hong Kong, Taiwan, uh, South Korea, these Asian tiger countries that the USA had allowed to build themselves up with heavily state-run economies, Lee Kuan Yew, the strongman of Singapore, Park Chung-hee, the strongman of South Korea, all of these economies that the USA had allowed to use heavy-handed military Bonapartist measures to stabilize and build themselves up. Singapore went from third world to first world in 20 years because, you know, because Lee Kuan Yew used heavy-handed military state control over the economy to rapidly industrialize the country. The USA pulled all its money out of the Asian tiger countries, devastated them economically. There was a crash in the Asian markets that was very much planned. It was coordinated. The USA was tired of seeing all these authoritarian Bonapartist regimes that it had to tolerate during the time of the Cold War. It was tired of seeing them raise its people out of poverty, tired of seeing them uh, seeing them say no to austerity and neoliberalism. So it pulled the rug out from under them all at once. It was devastating. And in Ecuador, it was particularly devastating. Because in Ecuador, they were already suffering economically by being forced to adopt the U.S. dollar. And then they lost all the investment that was coming in from Asia because of the crash on the Asian markets. And in 1999, I, Caleb Maupin, as a 12-year-old child, went to Ecuador with my father, and I had no idea what I was going to. I went to a country that was in the middle of an economic crisis, a man-made famine. Over 100,000 people died in Ecuador as a result of the economic crisis that happened in those years. People fled from the countryside into the cities, begged for food. People fled the country in mass. There was just, there was malnutrition in the country. People were starving and dying. And the government of Ecuador was scrambling and they couldn't find a solution to it. It was a devastating time. And I went to Ecuador with my father. And I remember getting off the plane and just seeing the crowds of desperately poor, starving people at the airport and just being shocked just being utterly shocked. I had never seen that level of extreme poverty before. It was, it was horrifying to me what I saw in Ecuador. This was 1999. That was a turning point. 1999 was also the year of what was at that point the biggest school shooting that had ever happened. The Columbine Massacre. Remember Columbine? Columbine Massacre. It was on Hitler's birthday, April 20th, 1999. Two high school students went to their school and murdered 15 of their classmates. And everything we were told about it in mainstream U.S. media was a lie. We were told that the young men were members of a trench coat mafia, a gang called the trench coat mafia. Turns out the only time they'd ever been seen in trench coats was the day they shot up their school. There was a club called the trench coat mafia at their school. They weren't in it. That was a lie. We were told they did it because they listened to Marilyn Manson and his rock and roll, goth, goth metal rock and roll music. That was a lie. They didn't listen to that. We were told that they did it because they were bullied. They were victims of bullying. Well, it turns out that that was not the truth. They were not victims of bullying. In fact, one of the shooters was himself known to have been a bullier who bullied a number of students and would make threats and harass other students. He, and they, they were not victims of bullying. Their manifesto said nothing about bullying. 
everything we were told about the Columbine massacre when it happened was a lie. We were told it was, we were told all kinds of things. It was all bullshit. Everything we were told about it was a lie. They had this whole story about a, a young woman who had been killed for being a Christian, right? That, that they, the shooters had said to her, do you love Jesus? She'd said, yes. And then they killed her. And that wasn't true either. All kinds of witnesses said that didn't happen. That didn't stop them from making a sensational book from sending her mother on a speaking tour. This book, She Said Yes, was published everywhere. And, and it was she was a martyr. Oh my God, they asked her if she believed in Jesus. And she said yes, and the shooters killed her. And it didn't happen. It was a lie. All the witnesses that were there said, no, they just killed her. It was made up, but they made it this, this big right-wing evangelical religious movement about how she said yes. Oh my God, it was all a big fat lie. 1999 was a very interesting year. But it was the beginning of things shifting. The mass shooting phenomenon that now is so common in the United States, we don't even blink an eye anymore. There's a mass shooting so frequently in America, we almost don't notice anymore, right? There Wasn't there just some shooting, some trans person shot up a, a school, a, a Christian school or something, and then there was another shooting where somebody shot up. I don't even, we don't even notice anymore. Mass shootings happen Every day, practically, we don't even think about them. You know, there was the Sandy Hook one that was big. There was the Pulse nightclub. But nowadays, mass shootings happen so much. We sometimes it doesn't even make the news. But that's because we're coming apart as a civilization. This is that's a sign of societal decay. But in 1999, when the Columbine massacre happened, it was a really big deal. And 1999 was a turning point. Because the people of Latin America were starting to say no to austerity and neoliberalism and push back. And the people of Eastern Europe, of Russia, were starting to push back. And it was a year that we saw that that strategy the USA uses of color revolutions, destabilizing countries, they used it to attack Serbia with the propaganda that it was, that it was committing genocide when it wasn't. And they were using it to attack China. They were using the internet to stage protests with the Falun Gong and China shut it down. They said, we're not going to, we're not going to tolerate it. 1999 was a pivotal year. The world was starting to shift. After 10 years of austerity, 10 years of cutbacks, after 10 years of North Korea and Cuba and Iraq just being devastated, things started to shift. Folks, I don't know if you realize this. It is so weird how history, how history plays out. But in the 2000 election, George W. Bush, he did everything he could to not sound like a conservative. He said he was a compassionate conservative. He said he wasn't in favor of cuts in social programs. He said he didn't believe in regime change and intervention, George W. Bush. Many Muslim Americans voted for George W. Bush in 2000. I mean, the majority of Arab Americans voted for George W. Bush because Bill Clinton had killed so many Iraqis with the sanctions and Bill Clinton had become such a shill for Israel that Many Arab Americans and Muslim Americans voted for George W. Bush. I'm not not lying. Uh, it's, it's very wild. But George W. Bush got the votes of many Muslim Americans. Al Gore was running on a platform of, of human spreading human rights around the world and regime change. George W. Bush was running on a platform of it. It's not America's job to go into these countries and tell them how they have to be. <laughs> I think America should leave them alone. You know, that was that was Bush. Bush ran on a platform of um, he was going to intervene less. He would say, I am a compassionate conservative. No child left behind. That was what he called his his education plan. That sounds pretty left wing, right? No child left behind. I'm going to raise the standards. We're going to have better teachers in every classroom. We're going to make sure that no child is left behind. You know, um, 
Bush actually ran on a platform that he was basically running on a platform of, I am not Ronald Reagan. That was the Bush platform. You can vote for me because I'm not a normal conservative. I'm way to the left. I am not Ronald Reagan. That's basically what he ran on. He was a compassionate conservative. He was a non-interventionist, no child left behind. You know, that's what he ran on. And people still thought he was an idiot. And people were a little bit nervous about his ties to the evangelical Christian right. He spoke at a very hard right-wing college that had, was known for not allowing interracial dating, Bob Jones University. And people were a little bit nervous about it. And he lost the popular vote, but there was that whole Florida recall situation and you know recount and the Supreme Court gave it to him and Bush became president. And when Bush became president, he was very weak as a president. He was down in the polls. People didn't like him. And then the economy started to take a shift downward. There was an economic downturn almost as soon as Bush came into office. And that was the situation. Meanwhile, on the Korean Peninsula, you had a government that was talking about reconciling with North Korea. You had the sunshine policy. And you had a government on the Korean Peninsula that was starting to say, you know what? Let's not fight with the North. And you had the sunshine policy. And in the late 90s, South Korea was moving in a friendlier direction toward North Korea. Even though the United States was devastating North Korea, economically, South Korea was getting friendlier toward North Korea. It was a strange moment. But then... 9-11 happened, September 11th, and 9-11 shook everything up. It was a complete reshuffle of U.S. politics. It was a complete, complete reshuffle. Everything changed. Everything changed after 9-11. You know, the two, the Twin Towers went down, the Pentagon was hit, the country was terrified, everyone was terrified they were going to die, and everyone was out waving flags and Oh, it was it was a huge patriotic mobilization. The country was in this patriotic frenzy and people were joining the military in droves. And and right after 9-11, you'll remember that George W. Bush gave his famous axis of evil speech. His famous axis of evil speech. And after 9-11, he named three countries as part of the axis of evil, Iraq, Iran, and North Korea. Now, those are three countries that had nothing to do with 9-11. 9-11 was committed by Saudis. People from Saudi Arabia, which is a U.S.-aligned country, people who had fought in alliance with the United States against the Soviet Union and Afghanistan. That facts didn't matter. We were told that somehow Iraq was involved in 9-11 and the USA invaded Iraq and invaded Afghanistan first and then Iraq. And Iraq is a major oil producing country. After a decade of weakening Iraq with sanctions and preventing food and medicine from getting to Iraq and my old boss, Ramsey Clark, breaking the law heroically, going to the airport with lots of medicine and holding a press conference and announcing that he was going to bring medicine to the Iraqi people and he wanted them to prosecute him and flying all that medicine to Iraq, having his bank accounts frozen, but the U.S. government never arrested him because they didn't want him, want to give him the publicity. After a decade of weakening Iraq with sanctions and just weakening Iraq with sanctions after 9-11, they blamed Iraq for 9-11, which was just a big lie. And the USA invaded Iraq, and it blew Iraq to shreds. Shock and awe. Iraq was blown to bits, this major oil exporting country. I mean, and they called it shock and awe. And if you look at what the United States did, they just blew up everything. All the power plants, all the water treatment facilities, all, I mean, major buildings, major stadiums, any anything. I mean, shock and awe. They just destroyed highways, bridges. They just blew blew Iraq to shreds. They just blew Iraq to shreds. Hundreds of thousands of people became refugees. At least 100,000 civilians probably died. 
And ever since then, Iraqi oil exports have been about 10% of what they were. And when the USA blew up Iraq, it had one very big result, which is the oil prices shot through the roof. The oil prices shot through the roof. And you would think at the time, people didn't even understand this. I remember it was really common. Right after the U.S. invasion of Iraq, the gas prices were through the roof and people were furious about the gas prices. And people said, I thought we went there to get the oil. That was a really common thing. People say, if we invaded Iraq to get the oil, why is why is gas so expensive now? They just didn't get it. Gas was expensive because Iraq was destroyed. Iraq was blown up. And there was false scarcity created on the market and the oil prices shot up. And ExxonMobil and BP and Shell and Chevron made huge profits. Oil went up to $120 a barrel. At that point, that was some of the highest oil prices in history. But Bush driving those oil prices up. Not only did it make his friends at ExxonMobil, BP, Shell, and Chevron very wealthy, it had another result, which is that guy in Venezuela, Hugo Chavez, he was elected. And what does Venezuela have? It has oil. In 2002, the military tried to remove Hugo Chavez from office, tried to overthrow him with a coup, but he was so popular. He was brought back to office. And in 2003, when the U.S. invaded Iraq, Hugo Chavez, back in office, announced that he was a believer in 21st century socialism. His hero was Fidel Castro. He said, my hero has been Fidel Castro. He also said, I've been a Maoist since I was 15. And he started calling himself a 21st century socialist, a Bolivarian socialist. And he put the state, it was already technically nationalized, but he really nationalized the Venezuelan oil. And so Venezuela, this revolutionary anti-imperialist leader who was at the center of a coalition, they defeated a coup and he was getting more radical because they tried to overthrow him. And he was in a major oil producing country and the oil prices shot through the roof. So Hugo Chavez suddenly had loads of money. And with that money, he started building health care clinics in all the impoverished neighborhoods where Cuban doctors were giving free health care to poor Venezuelans. But he also, he also started giving funding to socialists in Bolivia and socialists in Nicaragua and socialists in Chile. And he started using Venezuela's oil money to spread his socialist communist movement throughout South and Central America. And Hugo Chavez was wildly popular and by shooting the oil prices up, Hugo Chavez expanded his influence throughout the region. Second thing that was done because of those oil prices, Vladimir Putin. Remember Vladimir Putin? He promised he was going to come in, fix Russia's economy by stable, putting it around state-controlled oil and gas. Well, George W. Bush did him a huge favor by shooting the oil prices up. Because that made it really fast for him to do it. And almost immediately, and we're talking 2004, 2005, Russia's economy had finally recovered. Industrial output had reached beyond the levels of the Soviet Union, meaning that they had economically recovered from the fall of the Soviet Union. The wages of Russian workers started to rise very significantly. Housing costs went down. The, the Russian government started providing housing to people. The healthcare system of Russia really improved. Putin got stronger. And then what else happened? Iran had been drifting into an alliance with the United States. They didn't like Saddam Hussein. They were an Islamic government that rejected communism and Marxism. And the reformist leaders, Mousavi and others, they were in power. And so Iran was slipping Iran was slipping Iran was slipping into 
into the U.S. camp, the the middle class, the the Iranian capitalists, uh, you know, who started to have the upper hand and and had a, a hostile relationship with the Iranian government. They were starting to move Iran into the U.S. camp. But then, when George W. Bush called Iran the axis of evil in a speech. A lot of the Iranians said, oh, no, we're not going to trust the United States. They're calling us the axis of evil, number one. A lot of Iranians said they're not going to support the United States when the president of the United States is aligned with a lot of Christian pastors who hate Muslims and say Islam is an evil religion. And then on top of that, what happened? The oil prices shot up. And what do they have a lot of in Iran? Oil. They have a lot of oil. They've got lots of oil in Iran. But who owns the oil in Iran? The government. And so it was the hardliners, the fanatical wing of the Islamic revolution, the ones who rallied around slogans, not capitalism, but Islam, neither East nor West, war of poverty against wealth. The hardliners in Iran got a surge because the oil prices went up and America had called them the axis of evil. And Ahmadinejad took office. Ahmadinejad took office. The first hardliner president that Iran had had in a long time, Ahmadinejad, he took office. And immediately when he took office, a number of Iranian communists, this is true, who'd been living in exile, had fled the country after the, after the revolution because they were at odds with the, the Khomeini government. When Ahmadinejad took office, Thousands of Iranian communists went home. Did you know this? Thousands of Iranian communists were told, you know, as long as you're not trying to spread, you know, non-Islamic Marxism in the Islamic Republic, as long as you're an anti-imperialist and you're against the American imperialists, you can come home. And Iran got really close to Cuba. And Iran got really close to Venezuela. Hugo Chavez went to Iran and hung out with Ahmadinejad. And suddenly Iran started drifting into a revolutionary anti-imperialist mode again. So George W. Bush's stupid decision to attack Iraq, which was motivated by the slipping U.S. economy, was motivated by the fact that anti-imperialism was starting to gain around the world, was motivated by a desire to make profits for the oil companies, it started backfiring. Economically, it was backfiring. George W. Bush got reelected in 2004. In the 2004 election, Pat Buchanan, the conservative commentator, he said, this is very interesting to me. I think about this statement a lot. He said it was Michael Moore versus Mel Gibson. That's what he said. I remember the 2004 election very well. I was in high school. And it was Michael Moore versus Mel Gibson. In the summer of 2004, two movies came out that were box office hits. One was called Fahrenheit 9-11 by Michael Moore. And the other was called Passion of the Christ by Mel Gibson. And both of those movies were selling out the box offices. And both of those movies were not liked by the American establishment. Michael Moore... The New York Times might have liked him, but mainstream American TV said he's far left. He likes dictators like Fidel Castro. And they didn't trust Michael Moore. Saturday Night Live would always, they'd always have a dig at him that it's, oh, it's propaganda. It's far left. And Mel Gibson, his movie Passion of the Christ, they said it was anti Semitic. They said it was Jew hatred. It was anti Semitic. It was religious bigotry. Uh, Mel Gibson, the fact that his father is a Holocaust denier and that he, you know, had said some anti-Semitic things and, you know, they didn't like it. But Americans in their millions went to see Fahrenheit 9-11 and Passion of the Christ. And it was very weird because both of those films were made by wings of the establishment that are at odds. Michael Moore was kind of a social democrat had been friendly with the Communist Party and the Workers' World Party in the 80s. Mel Gibson was a friend of Pat Buchanan, a paleoconservative, a traditionalist Catholic. His father was a notorious Holocaust denier and 
anti-Semite, and that Mel Gibson, Mel Gibson and Michael Moore were giving expression to what many Americans were starting to feel in their bones. There were anti-establishment sentiments beneath the surface. Michael Moore wrote a book shortly after he made his movie, Fahrenheit 9-11, and he dedicated it to Rachel Corey, the American woman from the state of Oregon who was murdered by the Israelis, was run over by an Israeli bulldozer. And Mel Gibson was notorious for his anti-Semitic comments about Israel and Israeli influence in American politics. And it was very weird. It seemed like two slightly anti-Israel filmmakers had made two passionately emotional films. And the people who went to see Passion of the Christ largely voted for George W. Bush. And the people who went to see Fahrenheit 9-11 largely voted for John Kerry. It was very weird, but it was a sign of things to come. Because neither Michael Moore nor Mel Gibson were loved by the American establishment. Both of them were distrusted. Mel Gibson was considered to be a far-right extremist. Michael Moore was considered to be a far-left extremist. But yet the ruling class were fighting with each other. Divisions existed beneath the surface because what because of what George W. Bush had done, because of the results, the negative results of Bush's invasion of Iraq. And so we started to see the beginning of a fight in the ruling class where they would use figures from untrusted wings of politics. It was very interesting. It was the beginning of, of a very interesting turn. George W. Bush won the election in 2004. And then after that, you had Hurricane Katrina, which was a devastating moment, right? Remember, I mean, Hurricane Katrina happened. Thousands of black people were left on their rooftops to die. People were, you know, rounded up in a stadium in the, in the Superdome. And it was like a mini concentration camp, the way they were trapped there. Uh, and with, with the National Guard, you know, lording over them, it was a horrendous situation. Go and read what was done in New Orleans. Uh, you know, there was a quote from one of these you know, austerity promoting conservatives who said, oh, you know, we wanted to get rid of public housing, but God did it for us, you know, thanking the hurricane for destroying public housing in Louisiana. It was a big moment. It was a big moment. And all of a sudden, those problems, those problems that George W. Bush had been dealing with when he first came into office, the economic downturn started to come back. I don't know if folks remember, but after 9-11, George W. Bush said, if you want to help defeat Al-Qaeda, you must go shopping. You want to defeat the terrorists, you got to go shopping. Got to go shopping. That was what he said. And a lot of people thought it was a really stupid thing to say. But what he was pointing out was the spending power of the American people had decreased. Americans couldn't afford to keep spending the way they once had. The wages and incomes of average Americans were going down. The rate of household debt, student debt, credit card debt was rising. Americans just couldn't afford to keep spending. And so Alan Greenspan was sitting at the Federal Reserve looking at the economy and he was saying, oh shit, we've got to keep Americans spending money. We have got to keep Americans spending money. So Congress started ripping up all the regulations about lending money. All kinds of lending practices that were completely illegal were being legalized to keep Americans spending money. And in those years, we're talking 2005, 2006, all kinds of predatory lending practices went on. They had ads on television, take out a second mortgage on your house. Americans were being told, take out a second mortgage on your house. You know, oh, you want to buy a home here? Here's a loan you can get. Oh, what? Your income is low. We will, we'll figure it out. All kinds of rip off lending practices that had been completely illegal where you you know someone someone buys a house and they get a mortgage and they pay it for a year and they pay it for two years and then on the third year it triples the payment triples you know things like that were going on it was it was insane the the lending practices that was going on uh and all of a sudden 
in order to keep Americans spending all kinds of lending practices, people were being sent credit cards and, you know, that they would pay, have to pay 300% interest. And it was insane what was going on. It was absolutely insane what was going on. People were being ripped off left and right in ways to keep money flowing into the economy. But it only lasted for so long. And as we know, the housing bubble burst. The housing bubble burst, but that's coming later. But what happened in 2006? In 2006, Israel was seeing Iran get stronger. Iran was getting stronger in the Middle East. The oil prices were rising. You know, Iran and the hardliners were getting stronger. And Lebanon is a country that borders Israel. And Lebanon. Lebanon, there's a very big organization there that's aligned with Iran called Hezbollah. And Israel was feeling threatened by how popular Hezbollah was becoming, how many, how many people were joining Hezbollah, how Hezbollah's influence was rising as Iran's influence was rising. So in 2006, Israel invaded Lebanon. And they had no idea what they were coming for. Israel walked into Lebanon and Hezbollah destroyed Israel. Hezbollah kicked Israel's ass. It just pounded the shit out of Israel. The Israeli invaders didn't know what hit them. Israel invaded Lebanon and the, the Hezbollah people were on their rooftops with snipers and they, they had, you know, landmines and booby traps. And oh my goodness, Israel has never suffered as much of an epic defeat as they received in 2006. Israel went into Lebanon and they went out of Lebanon and Hezbollah pounded the Israeli army. The IDF got epically destroyed. Here's a wild story. I didn't know this. This is true, though. I fact-checked it. During the war, the Israelis had this brilliant idea about how they were going to pull off their invasion of Lebanon. They broadcast porn on the TV. Did you know this? This is a wild story. But Israel, when they invaded Lebanon, they had this idea that, you know, Lebanon's a very conservative Islamic country. So we're going to put porno all over the TV. And the, the, the Lebanese people, they'll just be so sexually aroused, they'll all be looking at their TVs and they won't fight us when we invade. Did you know this? This was actually one of Israel's strategies. And so when Israel's military marched into, marched into Lebanon, they broadcast pornography on all the TVs of Lebanon. I am not making this up. This is actually true. Google it. It is one of the most insane things. I have talked to people from Lebanon who said this happened. All of a sudden, Regular families in Lebanon were watching TV and porn, the most vile, disgusting porn came up on the TV. And Israel was convinced, oh, you see, this is a conservative Islamic society. The people see the porn and they'll just be so turned on. They'll watch the TV and we'll be able to defeat them. Well, it didn't work. Most Lebanese families just turned the TV off. And Israel just got epically destroyed when they invaded Lebanon. And all over the world, Muslims, opponents of Israel, supporters of the Palestinians were chanting, long live Hezbollah, long live Hezbollah. And when they started rebuilding, and this is fascinating to me, when they started rebuilding the areas in Lebanon that Israel had attacked, they started putting up murals of Hugo Chavez and murals of Che Guevara and murals of Kim Il-sung, and murals of Palestinian fighters and resistance fighters. And Hezbollah started saying, we don't see ourselves. We don't see ourselves just as, as, as you know, one group of people fighting Israel. We're fighting a global imperialist system. Hezbollah, Hezbollah, suddenly positioned itself. They were sounding like Marxists and communists. They were, you know, they were putting up pictures of Che Guevara, putting up pictures of Hugo Chavez. It was a big turning point. And Venezuela was sending people over to, over to Lebanon to, to, to support them. It was like suddenly the global anti-imperialist camp had surged. Suddenly the global anti-imperialist camp had surged forward. 
And George W. Bush was the president of the United States. And he had called he had called the attack on you know the, the the fight against terrorism a crusade, and that those comments had gotten widely publicized. And Russia was back in business and they were going strong, and Iran was back in business, and Bolivarian socialism was rising in South and Central America. And the U.S. economy, finally then, the nail in the coffin of the Bush administration was 2000, 2008, the U.S. economy crashed. The economic crisis happened. The housing bubble burst. That was the end. And Barack Obama came in as the savior he was going to ride in on a white horse to save the day. And Barack Obama came in. He had a Muslim middle name, Hussein. He was the first black president of the United States. He gave a big campaign speech in Berlin, in Germany. He was going to make, make friends with Europe again. Bush had alienated Europe. The NATO countries had not supported the invasion of Iraq. Obama came in. Yes, we can. Yes, we can. It was this great epic turning point, we were told. Obama came into office. And when Obama came into office, you'll remember that Hillary Clinton had been his main opponent. He appointed Hillary Clinton as his Secretary of State. You'll remember that in 2009, right after Barack Obama had taken office, the military of Honduras overthrew the government. And Barack Obama was asked about it. And he said, you know, do you support the military in Honduras overthrowing the government? And he said, that's not legal. And the reason he said that is because he did not know that Hillary Clinton had arranged the whole thing. Hillary Clinton had been meeting with the military leaders in Honduras, planning the overthrow of the Honduran government. But Barack Obama didn't even know about it. Furthermore, Hillary Clinton appointed Jared Andrew Cohen, a former executive from Google Alphabet, to be in the State Department. And Jared Andrew Cohen became the U.S. government's go-between go man between Twitter and the U.S. State Department. And he was frequently going and meeting with Twitter and advising Twitter about how to manipulate social media to serve U.S. foreign policy goals. And he was doing it without the permission of Barack Obama. And at one point... He went to Twitter and told them to amplify certain tweets against the Iranian government. And he did this without asking Obama. Obama heard about it and he said, I want this guy fired. He's going to Twitter and he's telling Twitter to amplify certain messages as if he has permission without the permission of the president. Obama tried to fire Jared Andrew Cohen and Hillary Clinton stepped in and protected him. We know this. This was released. This was public information that was released by, this was revealed in New Yorker magazine. Jared Andrew Cohen was Silicon Valley's man in the Hillary Clinton State Department. And Obama wanted him fired and Hillary Clinton made sure he wasn't fired. And then we know what happened with the Arab Spring. Unrest and chaos being spread all over the Middle East. There was a lot of unemployment in the Middle East. A lot of people were out of work and needed jobs. The economic crisis globally had happened. And so social media decided to just stir things up. And Twitter and Facebook and YouTube and Al Jazeera stirred up. And you had the Arab Spring destabilizing countries across the Middle East. Yeah, there was a spontaneous character to it. A lot of people were angry. There was an economic crisis. But the USA very clearly was manipulating the events. And they used it to destabilize and overthrow the Libyan government, destroy the most prosperous country on the African continent and the top oil exporting country on the African continent. And of course, the oil prices shot up even higher after that because Libya, you'll remember, uh, 
has never exported as much oil as it once did. The oil prices shot up. Civil war in Syria started going. And the Obama presidency was very much, it was that managerial bourgeoisie trying to use social media with Jared Andrew Cohen and the Hillary Clinton State Department, the big oil companies trying to maneuver to stabilize the economy and strategically unleash chaos against their enemies. You'll remember that right after the invasion, uh, after the destruction of Libya, there was oil, high oil prices for a while, and then there was the dramatic oil price drop. Oil prices shot down. Saudi Arabia started just flooding the market with cheap oil. Oil prices plummeted, and the fracking companies all started losing money. And Iran's economy suffered, and Russia's economy suffered, and Venezuela's economy really suffered. You'll remember that. There was a strategic oil price drop. And when that strategic oil price drop happened, it was very clearly planned. Saudi Arabia was doing it in coordination with the United States for geostrategic reasons. It was to hurt Venezuela. It was to hurt Iran. It was to hurt Russia. And in the United States, it was to hurt Republicans. It was to hurt the Koch brothers. It was to hurt the fracking companies. That's who it was to hurt. It was to hurt the conservatives in the United States because the lower, the smaller oil companies have always been pretty conservative in their alignment. Now, BP, Shell, and Chevron, uh, they tend to be pretty, at this point, pretty aligned with the Democrats. Exxon Mobil, BP, Shell, and Chevron, but the lower, the smaller oil companies, the, the Texas oil families, the, the Koch brothers, the, the frackers, Devon Energy, people like that, they tend to be conservatives. Uh, they tend to be conservatives. So Barack Obama was declaring economic warfare on Republicans and waging economic warfare against Venezuela and Iran and Russia. It was strategic. It was very, very strategic. It was very, very strategic. And social media became the vehicle through which the Obama administration could push forward its agenda. And that's when you saw a rise of dissent. And Donald Trump and his ascendancy was largely Americans saying that what Obama had promised to fix wasn't fixed. Racial unrest was certainly not fixed. Barack Obama had given a speech saying he was going to create a more perfect union. Oh, we're going to create a more perfect union. I can't denounce uh, Pastor Jeremiah Wright more than I can denounce uh, my racist white grandmother. Um, and we're going to be a more perfect union. Yep, I'm Barack Obama. We're going to get over our racial racial problems. I'm going to bring the country together. And he didn't. By the time Barack Obama left office, Ferguson, Missouri had had months of rebellions and rioting. Baltimore had gone up in flames and the National Guard had been sent in. Police killings and brutality was happening everywhere. Anger at the government, at the ruling class was rising. The economy of the United States had not improved. Living standards had not gone up. Barack Obama's presidency Barack Obama's presidency hadn't made the lives of Americans better. And it had really depended largely on just squeezing the lower level capitalists, the fracking companies, the, the lower level Wall Street guys. They didn't appreciate Dodd-Frank and the economic regulations. And Donald Trump's ascendancy into office was very much seen as the lower levels of capital pushing back against Silicon Valley, pushing back against the big four super major oil companies. That was what was going on. Donald Trump was very close with Sheldon Adelson and the Netanyahu wing of Israeli politics. Israel's politics are very polarized. You have one wing of Israeli politics that's tied in with the global capitalist imperialist system. 
And then you have another wing of Israeli politics that is tied in with the hard Israeli right wing, the settlers, the people who've immigrated to Israel from Eastern Europe. A lot of them speak Russian. And those folks are not interested in helping the global capitalist system. They just want to do what's good for them. And that's Netanyahu's people. And that's who Trump was close with. Sheldon Adelson was close with those people. That's who Trump was with. He was with the hard Israeli right wing. Meanwhile, Barack Obama was hoping to set off a color revolution in Cuba. Right before they'd had a color revolution in Libya, Obama had been all friendly with Gaddafi, improved relations. They'd slipped their forces in there and they'd had a, an overthrow of, of Gaddafi in Libya. And Barack Obama went to Cuba, established diplomatic relations. And we now know he was setting up a Cuban Twitter. They had all kinds of CIA apps and they were hoping to seep American influence into Cuba and destabilize it. But Trump was in with the Miami Cubans, the people who fled Cuba. And so Trump got in there and he pulled all kinds of U.S. forces out, out of Cuba, put a monkey wrench in it. Barack Obama, the crowning achievement of his presidency had been the Iran nuclear deal. Donald Trump ripped that up. And there was, there was a fight in the ruling class taking place. Donald Trump started to improve things with North Korea. Donald Trump wanted to be known as the guy who improved relations with North Korea. And Donald Trump just didn't buy, for whatever reason, he did not buy the anti-Russia hysteria. He wasn't a pro-Russian president. Donald Trump got rid of a lot of nuclear agreements with Russia, the Clear Skies Agreement and the, you know, the inter Intercontinental uh, Nuclear, uh, the INF Treaty. Uh, he got rid of a lot of nuclear deals that hurt Russia. Donald Trump, you know, he sent lethal aid to Ukraine, but he just... If you listen to his administration, the idea that Russia, we got to just do everything to destroy Russia, he didn't buy it. He didn't buy it. He met with Putin. You know, he, he said, you know, it was an interesting meeting. He just didn't buy this memo that had been sent out by the Obama administration that, that Russia is enemy number one. We must destroy them. He, Trump just didn't believe that. And his administration did not operate on that basis. Trump murdered Qasem Soleimani. If you look at the time that Trump murdered Qasem Soleimani, it was at a time he was facing impeachment. You know, he was on he was facing an impeachment trial. And it seemed like they, that he needed to prove himself to the Israel lobby. He needed all of those Republicans to vote against vote against impeachment. Only one Republican senator voted to impeach Donald Trump, Mitt Romney. The rest of them stood behind Donald Trump. But right before that, Trump murdered the national hero of Iran, Qasem Soleimani, this well-known general. And that was a huge favor for Israel. And you have to wonder if that was something Donald Trump did to make sure he didn't get impeached, to make sure he stayed in office. Uh, it was pretty wild what Donald Trump did and the timing of it. It was right when he was being impeached. And he was being impeached over asking for political favors from Ukraine. The whole thing was very, very strange. Very, very strange. Right? Very, very, very strange. The timing of the murder of Qasem Soleimani, the top Iranian general. It was at a time when Trump was in danger of losing his position as president. It was very, very odd. The Trump presidency was very, very odd. Trump had many different constituencies he was trying to please. He made a deal with many, many people. And then right before Trump left office, you had the pandemic. And the pandemic devastated the lower levels of capital. Hobby Lobby, the stores, those folks are backers of Trump. They were devastated. My Pillow, big backers of Donald Trump, devastated. Fracking companies were just devastated. Oil went into the negative. Oil was in the negative. You'll remember the first couple of weeks of the pandemic, oil prices were negative, meaning that it cost more it cost more to barrel oil than 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 it did, you know, for oil. I mean, it was it was insane. We had negative oil prices. Fracking companies were devastated. But Jeff Bezos made out like a bandit during the pandemic. The Walton family made out like bandits during the pandemic. And the pandemic ensured that wealth flowed into the hands of the ultra monopolies and small businesses were just completely pummeled. And then 
everything we now know that a lot of forces that had originally supported Donald Trump sat down and there was a concerted effort to make sure Donald Trump left office. But Donald Trump and his allies in the lower levels of capital, they decided to go out with a bang. And we saw what happened on January 6th. But we also know now that while Donald Trump definitely intended to go out with a bang, it seems to have echoed through the intelligence agencies and the FBI that he was planning to go out with a bang. And they arranged for the bang that Trump went out with to be one that they could use to pass all kinds of oppressive laws and throw all kinds of Trump supporters in jail. And that Trump's plan, which was basically, I mean, the way it looks to me, you know, when Bill Clinton left office, year 2000, you know, he made a point of, you know, pooping in his bed before he left. I mean, I'm, he didn't literally poop in his bed, but I'm exaggerating. They pried all the W's off of all the computers. Uh, they trashed the office, right? Bill Clinton was known to do that. If the other party won, they would trash things for the other side. That's just something that Bill Clinton was famous for doing. He nailed the doors shut. Um, you know, you know, he nailed the doors shut. of his governor's mansion in in Indiana or in Arkansas. He pried the W's off the keyboard. Donald Trump wanted to do something a little more than that. He was hoping that he would leave office. He would leave office by making a big scene in the Capitol, you know, but he didn't expect it to go as it did. And I think his plan to make a big mess before he left office was maneuvered, backfired, and they used it. They turned it into something that Donald Trump didn't intend for it to turn into in order to prevent him from, in order to prevent him from, um, from being able to run again. So this is how we got where we are. It's taken me an hour and a half to say all of this because I, I wanted to get you, I wanted you to understand all the factors that lead up to this, all the international factors, all the domestic factors. This is how we got where we are. This is how we got where we are. But what do we do about it? Ah, what do we do about it? I've got to tell you, I get into great detail about that on a lot of these streams. But tonight, I will emphasize what is really important. February 19th, the rage against the war machine rally was the most important protest and demonstration in U.S. recent history. There has not been a protest like rage against the war machine anywhere near as important in at least 10 or 20 years. You had Dennis Kucinich, Jimmy Dore, Tulsi Gabbard. You had Judge Napolitano. You had Garland Nixon. It was a really, really important demonstration. It was the Libertarian Party and the People's Party that sponsored it. But we, the Center for Political Innovation, we were also sponsors of it. The February 19th Rage Against the War Machine rally was the beginning of an anti-monopoly government, an anti-monopoly coalition. It was lower-level capitalists. It was socialists and working-class organizers. It was progressives. It was conservatives and Republicans. It was military people like Tulsi Gabbard. It was many, many different forces came together. They said, we don't want a low-wage police state. We don't want them to jail Julian Assange. We don't want them to violate our civil liberties. We don't want tech censorship. And we don't want a new war with Russia or China. It was a really important development. And it is that wing of American politics that is not loyal to the left in a culture war, not loyal to the right and their, you know, their belief that commies all are a bunch of traitors, evil people who need to be killed, but loyal to the idea that we want to make a better country. And that means protecting our civil liberties. 
That means opposing new wars. And that means bringing people together. This is really important. If you're a serious socialist, serious anti-imperialist, this is where you need to focus your energy. That wing of American politics, the Kim Iverson, Jimmy Dore, Tara Reid, Center for Political Innovation, Mises Caucus, Convo Couch wing of American politics, that is where we need to put our energy. The Tulsi Gabbard axis, that is the only hope right now. And we need to do everything we can to build up this alliance of progressives and labor unionists and libertarians and lower level capitalists and military people and construct an anti-monopoly coalition. Construct a government, a movement demanding an anti-war government in America. A government that wasn't a tool of Jeff Bezos, a tool of ExxonMobil, BP, Shell, and Chevron, a tool of Mark Zuckerberg, but a government that stood up to them and believed in economic growth. A government that wasn't anxious to engage in regime change wars, but had the opposite instinct and would do everything it could to provoke, promote cooperation and development. We need an anti-monopoly coalition in America. That's what we need. And that is the that is the hope right now. What Obama failed to do in his presidency is what Obama, what Obama's, you know, vice president Biden is now trying to do. They're trying to get control of it. They're trying to degrow the country and stabilize it with degrowth. They're trying to use social media to control to control people's minds. They're trying to set the stage for a new world war and a low-wage police state. And the answer is an anti-monopoly coalition an anti-monopoly coalition that fights for an anti-war government. And that means going to average Americans. And at the same time that we're building the anti-monopoly coalition, we also need to be bringing forward our revolutionary socialist program. We need to be telling people that we need a government of action to fight for working families. We need America's Natural gas and coal and timber to become public property. Our natural resources should be used to make America a better country. We should be telling Americans that the banking system should be organized to serve the public and strategically assign credit in the interest of the country overall. We should be telling Americans that we need a mass program to give this country a high-tech makeover, rebuild America, new bridges, new highways, new high-speed railway systems, fusion energy research, new universities, new schools. We need to tell Americans that we could have an economic bill of rights like Roosevelt proposed. We need to bring forward our program and our unique socialist, anti-imperialist understanding into this coalition. And that anyone who is campaigning for RFK or campaigning for the Libertarian Party or campaigning for, for Marion Williamson are campaigning for any of the alternative candidates that are going to run in 2024. Anybody who is run who who, who is going to going to be campaigning for those people needs to encounter a CPI organizer, needs to get invited to a CPI weekend workshop, needs to learn about our program and our message. We will build our own organization, but we will utilize our organization to build the anti-monopoly coalition. We'll be marching in the streets with the Mises Caucus. We'll be marching in the streets with Jimmy Dore. We'll be marching in the streets with Tulsi Gabbard. We'll be marching in the streets with uh, Diane Sayre and Helga Zepp LaRouche. We'll be marching in the streets with every wing of the anti-monopoly coalition that we can find. We must build the anti-monopoly coalition, and we must be the communist, anti-imperialist, 21st century socialist wing the Socialism with American Characteristics wing of the Anti-Monopoly Coalition. Because as the Anti-Monopoly Coalition gets kicked around, and as it realizes how desperate the low-wage police state is, and as they do things like the horrendous persecution they're raining down on the Uhuru movement right now, more and more forces in the Anti-Monopoly Coalition are going to say, you know what, libertarianism isn't enough. 
It's not enough. The idea that government just keeps its hands off, that's not enough. If they're going to have a government that beats us down for the big monopolies, the only thing that's going to protect us is a government of action that fights for working families. We need a government that'll kick Jeff Bezos' ass. We need a government that'll kick the ass of, ass, ass of Exxon Mobil and BP and Shell and Chevron. We need a government that'll kick the crap out of the, ho the, the Hollywood money shark mo movie profiteers and propagandists. We need a government that'll kick the crap out of Silicon Valley and Mark Zuckerberg. We need a government of action that'll stand up to the big monopolies, that'll protect the rights of workers on the job, protect the rights of small business owners, protect the rights of farmers, protect the rights of all kinds of people, protect the 99% from the 1%, a government of action that will fight for working families, an anti-monopoly government, a people's democracy of all the anti-fascist forces. After the Soviet Union liberated countries in Eastern Europe, they didn't immediately form communist governments. They formed people's democracies. And it was every, every force in the country that had opposed the Nazis merged into one government. The Communist Party, the Christian Party, the Social Democratic Party, the liberal, the liberal mainstream Democratic parties, they all were unified into one people's democratic coalition to defeat fascism, to defeat the big monopolies, an anti-fascist popular front government. That is what we need in America right now an anti-monopoly coalition. But we know that the communists, those of us who have our understanding of socialism and Marxism, we're going to be essential in this coalition because only we understand why things are happening. We understand the problem of overproduction and the tendency of the rate of profits to fall. We understand how their system works and why it's in crisis. We understand why they need fascism. And so with our understanding, we can be at the center of an anti-fascist, anti-monopoly coalition to march the United States toward a new world of growth and prosperity and abundance. We will build an anti-monopoly coalition. We will build an anti-war government and we will build the center for political innovation. And we will do this as the first step in marching the United States towards socialism with American characteristics, socialism rooted in our great American revolutionary traditions. John Brown is alive. Harriet Tubman is alive. Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. is alive. Eugene Debs, Gus Hall, William Z. Foster, Huey Newton are alive. The forces of anti-monopoly popular power, democracy, peace, jobs, equality, the forces that have battled against the horrors of slavery and war and oppression and injustice on these very shores, the progressive spirit of the American people will awaken and we shall be the ones to awaken it. And it will take its rightful place as the ruling force in this land. And it will join arm in arm with the people of the world to reject imperialism, to reject fascism and supremacism and war, and to march toward a world of brotherhood and friendship. Long live the great unity of the people of the world. Long live the international working class and long live the Center for Political Innovation. Thank you very much. And on that note, we shall begin the roll call. Names and locations, names and locations. I will call you all out as I see you. Names and locations, names and locations. Who is with us tonight? We got Yonatan Mahari in Stockholm, Sweden. Welcome. Welcome. Welcome, welcome. Jenny Lynn, I know she's in Cincinnati. We got David. Shout out to David. He's in Australia. We've got Garland in Oklahoma. It's me in Georgia, says Gavin. David in Columbia, Illinois. Zach Bunch in Richmond, Virginia. David Rennie in Hamilton, Ontario. Jenny in Cincinnati. We got Chris in Salt Lake City. Phil in Miami. We got Temple City, California. Kinky and Joshua Tree. 
is with us. We've got Ellie in Chicago. Shout out to you, Ellie. We got Molly McGuire in Orange County. Nathan is watching from somewhere in Asia. Shout out to you, Nathan. Love your work. Love what you are doing. We got Richmond, Sawaki. We got John Witte in Houston. Zirus in Denmark. Alex from Brazil. Welcome, welcome, welcome. We got Heidi in Edinburgh, Scotland. Patch in Arizona. Welcome, welcome, welcome. We got Binghamton, New York. Love blind hate. We got Thor in Norway. Catalonia, Spain. Welcome, welcome, welcome. They liked my talk in Catalonia. Micah in Las Vegas. Welcome, welcome, welcome. So glad to be here with all of you. So glad to be here with all of you. Names and locations. And then we're going to start answering your super chat questions. So if people have more super chats, shoot them my way. We got a long list here, but we're going to try our best. John McCarthy in Chicago did a great, great presentation. We're going to post later. I was hoping to show it to you all tonight, but I'm going to have to show you on a future stream. He did a great presentation on the Uhuru Movement Solidarity Call. It's coming up. It was just excellent. Really great stuff. We got Colin in Greensboro. Mariah in North Carolina, as a prisoner for the Lord, then I urge you to live a life worthy of the calling you have received. Great stuff. Great stuff. Ben near Rockingham is with us. Names and locations. We got Tyler in Missouri. Tyler is great. He's got a new podcast on Scott Ritter's channel. Go and check it out. Strange Bedfellows. I just did an episode with them last night. It was awesome. Lori Spencer was on there. The two of them are, are great. They're great folks. Great channel they've got over there. Names and locations, names and locations. I will call you all out as I see you. AJ in NJ. AJ in North New Jersey is with us. All right. Very, 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 very good. Very, very good. I'm going to start answering your super chat questions. First one, thoughts on the PC USA. That refers to the Party of Communist USA. Well, I know a lot of great people who are in the PCUSA, and there's a strong overlap in membership between the Center for Political Innovation and the Party of Communists. Um, you know, uh, there's a number of really great people. Um, and many times we've had Chris Halali, uh, who's a member of the Party of Communists, who ran for Congress in Vermont, uh, got like 10% of the vote. He has spoken at many CPI gatherings. I consider him to be a great friend. I mean, he's a military veteran, a U.S. Army veteran. He also fought in Syria. Um, you know, against ISIS. Uh, he's a great, great guy, Chris Alali. I, I really like Chris Alali, really great person. Um, and there's other people, you know, I've known uh, the guy who started PCUSA, Dr. Angelo D'Angelo. He lives not very far from me. He's over in Staten Island. I've been over to his house before. Uh, he's a very nice man. He's getting up there in age, but he's a very nice man. He's done a lot to make sure that the tradition of the Communist Party USA, some of their older books continue to get published. Um, you know, a lot of great people are in PC USA. And, uh, you know, you know, the Center for Political Innovation is not a political party. We are a think tank that engages in anti-imperialist education. We put on classes and seminars. Our next class and seminar is coming up. It'll be uh, it'll be coming up. It'll be in Missouri. Uh, uh, June 23rd through 25th. That's a Friday, Saturday, and Sunday. So if you you have to join to be to attend, you have to be an invited guest or, or join. So if you want to come to that workshop, join, uh, join, join CPI, and we will invite you. It should be a nice weekend workshop. We're going to have the last weekend of June in Missouri. It's going to be awesome. I'm very excited about it. I have pumped about it. The, the place we have is just absolutely beautiful. And, uh, you know, different people are going to be given different classes. It's going to be really awesome. So join the Center for Political Innovation. And let me plug the great film, the amazing film that Peter Coffin made, this amazing documentary about the Center for Political Innovation and our recent summit against hypocrisy in Washington, D.C. If you haven't watched this film, you have got to watch this film. It shows you what it's like behind the scenes look at our planning and our conferences and the kind of work that we do. Go and check it out. Uh, really good stuff. Really, really good stuff. Um, go and watch. Go and check it out. Um, you know, uh, I mean, it was it's a beautiful film that Peter Coffin made about what what our conference was like, an intimate look at the different people that put on our conference and why we gathered for our summit against hypocrisy. Just a beautiful film. Link is in the description as well. Uh, it's beautiful. Uh, so yeah, PCUSA is a great group. I, uh, I'm friendly with them. You know, my perspective is different than theirs. They are Orthodox Marxist Leninists. Um, uh, whereas I see myself as 
you know, ML, Marxism, Leninism is the biggest influence on me politically. I was in a Marxist, Leninist, Communist Party for many years. I consider myself to be a communist. I draw heavily from Marx, from Lenin, etc. But I, I am at the point where I talk about 21st century socialism. I talk about socialism with American characteristics. I talk about, um, you know, I talk about more of a, a diverse thing. I think that, you know, there's many forms of anti-imperialism and socialism in the world today. Bolivarianism. Baathist Arab socialism, the axis of resistance in the Middle East centered around Iran and, and Syria. Uh, you know, um, there's many different anti-imperialist forces in the world, uh, and I'm not as strictly orthodox ML, whereas PCUSA is a traditional Marxist, Leninist, Communist Party. Uh, but that said, there's plenty of overlap. There's many members of, you know, I mean, Jonathan Blazer uh, has spoken at our conference. He spoke at our last conference about Serbia. And he's a member of the PCUSA. We had a representative of PCUSA who came and gave some remarks. Elizabeth, uh, you know, we, we, we are friendly with the PCUSA, um, you know, and just like at this point, the World Anti-Imperialist Platform, which is an international coalition of communists, uh, communist groups and others, um, you know, that have formed. There are only two, two organizations in the United States that signed the Paris Declaration. Uh, which is the declaration saying that that if World War III comes, Russia and China are right and U.S. imperialism is wrong. And the two organizations that have signed the Paris Declaration are the Party of Communist USA in the United States and the Center for Political Innovation. We are the two U.S. groups that have signed the World Anti-Imperialist Platform Declaration, the Paris Declaration. And on top of that, Jyoti Brar, who is the leader of the World Anti-Imperialist Platform, came and was a speaker at our conference uh, that we had um, in Washington, D.C. She's in the documentary that we just linked down below. So uh, that, you know, you know, PCUSA is a very friendly organization. I'm, I'm sure that there are differences within PCUSA. And I'm sure that, you know, not everyone in, in PCUSA probably is as friendly to us as some people are. But I have a very positive view of the Party of Communists USA. I, I see them in a positive light. Next question. What about the gray book on austerity behind you? Well, there's, I mean, this is green, actually. This is called Austerity, the History of a Dangerous Idea. Um, you know, and it's about neoliberal economics, you know, by Mark Blythe. I've read parts of it. But then there's also this book, The Shock Doctrine, which is also about austerity. And it's also a gray book. I mean, it's it's gray. It's by Naomi Klein. Um, I don't agree with a lot of what it says about China, but what it says about Russia, what it says about Latin America is very good. What it says about the origins of the Chicago School and Milton Friedman is very good. Um, you know, also this other book, uh, Europe Since 1989, that's also very good. That's about, you know, neoliberalism and and austerity, economic cutbacks, and its role in the European economy since the fall of the Soviet Union. Uh, so there you go. There you go. All right. Thoughts on critical race theory, a Marxist view. Well, critical race theory, the main critique of it, um, is that critical race theory frames things in terms of moralism. Uh, there are good people and there are bad people, and that, uh, you know, if you are a you are you are a person who is racist uh, or or prejudiced. You are a bad person. If you are an anti-racist, you're a good person. Uh, that that white people have white privilege and benefit from racism. And it's not that people who frame things that way are 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 pointing to things that are not true. That's not what they're doing. It is is it true that if you're white in America, your life is better than if you're black? Overwhelmingly, that is the case. No question about it. Is it true that being against racism is a morally righteous stand to take and being in favor of right racism is immoral. Yeah, that's not, that's certainly true. Um, you know, I mean, it's not that it doesn't point to true things, but it, it puts an interpretation of these true things that doesn't build solidarity. It, it creates an interpretation of these things that is designed to help stabilize U.S. imperialism. Racism hurts all workers and it benefits the ruling class, the capitalists. Uh, racism obviously most acutely hurts those who are victims of it, but it also hurts workers who are not victims of racism because it creates a division. And, you know, if you look at all the attacks on the living conditions here in the United States, often they're justified with racism. 
Uh, for example, Bill Clinton's welfare as we know it, the cut, you know, and aid to low-income families was done on the basis of racism. If you say welfare mother in America, most people immediately get an image in their mind of, of a heavyset black woman. But that is not an accurate picture. The majority of women with children who receive public assistance are white. But we all know the image of a welfare mother is a stereotype that has been promoted in order to advance austerity. Racism, people you say, oh, we're going to take money from welfare mothers. And people say, oh, yeah, I, I want to take money from that, you know, and that the way that they've cut back the welfare state in the United States has been on the basis of appealing to racism, right? Um, and the same with food stamps, right? If you say food stamps, the majority of people who get food assistance in the United States are white. However, if you frame it up as, you know, as people in their minds think food stamps are for black people or for Latin people, right? And that, that, the way that they have racialized economic questions enables a lot of white people to not to support austerity who wouldn't ordinarily support it, right? If you tell white people who are racist, if you tell them, wink, wink, nudge, nudge, you're taking money from those black people, they'll support it. But if you tell them you're just taking money from children, they won't support it. And that shows how dangerous racism is, right? That a lot of the people in the United States who are in favor of cutting social programs and actually hurting themselves economically uh, are people who do it on the grounds of racial prejudice. And that is a big problem. There's no question about it. There's no question about it. No question about it. So there you go. On the anniversary of the Nakba, well, this is the 75th anniversary of the destruction of the Palestinian people. I mean, the Palestinian people being violently driven from their homes as Israel was violently created. And since then, the Palestinians have lived under occupation. They've been brutally oppressed. Um, David Fox is announcing that he plans to be going to Palestine to stand in solidarity with the Palestinian people to report on them. And we are honored to have David Fox, somebody who's part of our community, uh, do that. And we'll hope that David Fox will do a lot of social media work, make a lot of videos and stuff. And we'll definitely have him on here to talk about his experiences over there. We'll be showing any videos um, that he makes, uh, you know, and we'll be doing everything we can to promote David Fox and his important work there. And today there were two big demonstrations in New York City, one in Bay Ridge uh, and the other in, in Times Square to support the Palestinians. And, you know, when Israel was created, that was an awful thing. And it was something the global communist movement got wrong. Let's just be real. Israel would not have happened if Stalin had not signed off on it. The global communist movement was under the impression that Israel was going to be a progressive country. We got hoodwinked. We got tricked. We got lied to. We got manipulated. Um, you know, and it was a huge mistake. Um, and, you know, it took a long time, especially in America, for communists to turn against Israel. The 1967 war was an important turning point. Um, and by the 1980s, it became very clear that Israel was an outpost of Western imperialism and, uh, and that the, the Soviet Union was on the side of the Palestinians and such. And, you know, uh, almost immediately the Soviet Union turned against Israel and regretted their mistake. And almost immediately Israel started accusing, um, you know, uh, started accusing the, the Soviet Union of being anti-Semitic. They claimed the doctor's plot was somehow anti-Semitic. You know, there were some doctors who'd been plotting against Stalin. Stalin executed them and they said, oh, it was anti-Semitism, even though the doctors weren't Jewish. It didn't even make any sense. But Israel started putting out propaganda against the Soviet Union. Uh, in Czechoslovakia, they found a number of Israeli spies. They found an Israeli spy ring and they hung them. Uh, and then Israel said, oh, they're just going after them because they're Jews. No, they're going after them because they were spying. And uh, immediately Israel started to make clear that their enemy was um, was the the Soviet Union, you know, and uh, but it took the American communists a long time because a lot of American communists are of Jewish heritage and because anti-Semitism was such a big part of fascism during World War II. Um, because of that, uh, the Communist Party USA, even to this day, the Communist Party USA recognizes Israel. The, the Communist Party USA is a Zionist organization. 
uh, in their official documents. It says they recognize Israel uh, and its right to exist. They criticize Israel, but they also are, are supporters of Israel. And that's a that's shameful. And I know the Party of Communist USA doesn't take that position. I know the Workers World Party and the PSL, Party of Socialism and Liberation, doesn't take that position. Um, but the global communist movement was dead wrong about Israel. And uh, Roosevelt was right about Israel. Uh, he was right about it. It, it. Roosevelt wanted nothing to do with Israel. And now the Holocaust Museum in Washington, D.C. goes out of its way to smear Roosevelt and to say that Roosevelt was somehow complicit in the Holocaust when he's the one who defeated Hitler, for Christ's sakes. He's the one who rallied the American people to fight the Nazis. But Israel hates Roosevelt still to this day. And they consider Roosevelt to be an anti-Semite, not because he was bad to American Jews, because Roosevelt was loved by American Jews, but because Roosevelt was, you know, not a supporter of Zionism and the creation of Israel. So there you go. There you go. All right. Why is Japan mostly far right and hating North Koreans? Well, you know, to be fair, right? I mean, I do want to be fair here. Um, you know, not that's I mean, you know, you could say that about America. America is mostly far right. Japanese politics has had a right wing a tinge to it, especially since the Second World War. But there is a large communist party in Japan with hundreds of thousands of members. There's a large socialist party in Japan that is more radical than the communist party that has many members. Um, you know, uh, there, there has been a history of resistance. The people of Okinawa have been heroically fighting for their independence from Japan. They consider themselves to be a colonized people. I did a great interview with an Okinawan uh, resistance fighter, um, you know, about that. And during the 1970s, there was the Japanese Red Army, which was like a, a Marxist armed group in Japan that like hijacked airplanes and flew them to North Korea. And, you know, there are a lot of Japanese people that are leftists and anti-imperialists. Um, and there are a lot of Japanese people who do want peace with North Korea, you know. Um, and uh, unfortunately, though, that is, you know, that is not the prevailing view in Japan, right? Right now, Japanese politics is dominated by anti-China sentiments, anti-Korean sentiments. And I would argue that's a result of the United States. And the United States very much pushes that. And I would argue, look at the assassination of Shinzo Abe. Right? Again, not telling you what actually happened, but it's one of those things where you have to go, huh, Shinzo Abe is a right-wing populist in Japan, conservative, not a leftist, but he liked Putin. He thought Putin was a cool guy. He hung out with Putin. And just as the Ukraine thing gets going, a leader who's very popular in Japan, who doesn't want to go along with it, gets killed. And how does he get killed? In Japan, you can't have a gun. Guns are like completely illegal in Japan. Police don't even carry guns. But this guy who shot Shinzo Abe shot him with a homemade gun, a gun the guy made himself out of plastic. You know how much skill that takes to make your own gun out of plastic? Not only that, he got two shots out of this gun. It was a double barrel. He got two shots out of this gun. Do you know how hard it is to aim and accurately shoot a homemade gun? You know how hard it is to make a homemade gun so good you can get two shots out of it? That's like, we're talking, that's like KGB, CIA level skill, right? And why did this guy shoot Shinzo Abe? What's the reason he gave? He's mad that his mother was a member of the Unification Church. And Shinzo Abe has gone and spoken at a few fundraisers with the Unification Church. So he killed Shinzo Abe. Hold up. Wait, what? What? That doesn't make any sense. And Shinzo Abe has been hanging out with the Unification Church and speaking to their stuff for decades. But just randomly, right when the Ukraine war is starting, a, a politician who's been speaking positively of Putin and isn't going to go along with the isolation of Putin just gets knocked off. And it's because he hung out with the Unification Church? Oh. And we know, thanks to this YouTube channel, that there is a whole network of people that have been harassing the Unification Church for decades. And it's led by the guy who also advises BreadTube named Dr. Steve Hassan. And that Dr. Steve Hassan 
has links to American intelligence. His mentor was Robert J. Lifton, the top military psychiatrist. And they had this whole pro practice of kidnapping people and doing what they called forcible deprogrammings. So there's a, there's a whole network of anti-unification church people that are involved in all kinds of illegal activities and are tied to American intelligence. And what happened, right? One of the most beloved prime ministers in Japan's history, Shinzo Abe, gets knocked off because of his ties to a religious minority. What would happen normally if a beloved president of America was killed for his ties to a religious minority? What would people do, right? Just like after the Pulse nightclub shooting, everyone put gay flags up on their page to show support for the gay community. If a politician in America was killed for being friendly to Muslims, all the lib all, all the people would be showing Muslim flags. If a politician in America was killed for his ties to Jews, Americans would all be putting stars of David everywhere. But what happened? After a beloved politician in Japan is killed, and the guy who kills him says he did it because of his ties to a religious minority group, was there a huge outpouring of support for the unification church in Japan? Because that's what would normally happen, right? A beloved politician is killed for his ties to a religious minority. There would be a, a huge flow, outflowing of support. But that's not what happened in Japan. The opposite has happened. Japanese media has gone into overdrive against the Unification Church, telling people the Unification Church is bad. That doesn't make any sense, right? If 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 a guy who killed a, a beloved politician hates the Unification Church, you should love the Unification Church then. But Japanese media has somehow twisted this, and they're cracking down like crazy on the Unification Church in Japan. Oh, and here's the icing on the cake. You ready for the icing on the cake? The Unification Church wants to restart negotiations with North Korea. The Unification Church, Hak Jahan Moon, Mother Moon, the leader of the Unification Church, has been sponsoring conferences with Mike Pompeo and Donald Trump about restarting the negotiations that Donald Trump did for peace on the Korean Peninsula. Now, if you look at that situation, if you don't immediately go, Huh? You should. You should. You should. The assassination of Shinzo Abe stinks. It stinks like rotten fish. It stinks like rotten fish. There are bigger forces at play here. Way bigger forces at play here. That's what I think. I'm not telling you what happened. But I'm just telling you, as someone who has intensely studied many aspects of this, there are way bigger forces at play here. I have a really hard time thinking that this guy, all by himself, was just sitting there seething in his room, mad at the Unification Church, so he went and shot Shinzo Abe with his homemade plastic gun. Don't buy it. Don't buy it. Not saying what actually happened. Right, because I'm not saying exactly what happened, but I'm just telling you all of the different factors involved there I just named make me think the official story is bullshit. This stinks. This stinks like a week old rotten fish. And something's off. Something is off. Something, something is off. Anyhow, next question. Do you think subway executions will become the norm now that this guy killed a homeless guy and got away with it? No, I don't. Um, no, I don't. I don't think that it will become the norm. Um, I will say the subways have gotten very scary and that subway, subway incidents are going to become more frequent, I think, because the subways are becoming scarier. Um, and people are going to be pumped up. And that this incident, yeah, I mean, this incident is probably going to cause more violence on the subways. People are going to be more afraid. People are going to be more angry. People are going to be, I mean, you know, as far as people dying, being killed, I don't know if that's going to happen more. Um, but, you know, in terms of incidents on the subway, yeah, people are going to be more on edge. The next time I get on the subway, I'm going to be way more nervous because of this. So there you go. There you go. Next question. 
The New York Tribune wasn't the Fox News of the 1800s. It went conservative after Karl Marx left. I was being facetious. I was being facetious. I was joking. The Republican Party was the left-wing party during the U.S. Civil War. It was aligned with Lincoln. Lincoln had the support of Karl Marx. He was associated with labor unions, etc. Right? I was... I'm joking in the sense that it was a Republican aligned newspaper. That's the joke. It's, it was, it's a bit of a joke. I really get annoyed by people like Dinesh D'Souza who say dumb shit. Like the Democrats supported slavery because they're communists. Like it just drives me up the wall. The communists supported Lincoln. How can he say that? And I mean, and it's like, I want to confront, it's like the only reason he gets away with saying dumb shit like that is because I'm not there. No one who knows anything is in the room to challenge him. When he gets there, yeah, so the Democrats support slavery because they are Marxists. And Marxists were key in abolishing slavery and were big supporters of the Republicans back then, you dumb, dumb fuck, right? And so I was doing a Dinesh D'Souza thing, being manipulative, right? Um, yeah, I agree with them on Korean unification. My experience with the unification church has been very negative. I do not trust them at all. Well, John, you obviously are not the first person to have ever said that. So, you know, and I'm not, I'm not here to shill for anybody. Um, I am here to, I am here to talk about the news on these streams. I do support Korean unification as well. So there you go. I have met people from that organization and I will say, I've many times interacted with them and they are nothing but the nicest people I've ever interacted with. Their beliefs are very different from my own, um, you know, but I respect them and their group has been subjected to a lot of stuff over the years. I mean, you know, you want to talk about cancel culture. That's a group that has just, they have had so much thrown at them over the years and yet they're still there, you know, and that makes me think that there's something, there's something spiritual that holds them together. Because if you think, I had no idea. I knew some of the stuff from back in the 70s. And it's like the amount of hate that has been thrown at that particular religious organization in America. I mean, you want to talk about a group that's been mega canceled, like over and over and over again. And yet there are still many people that, not many, there's still people who think that that's, you know, who, who are loyal to it amid everything. And that group has made a, a big difference in people's lives. So I, it's not the religion for me. I, I will never join them, obviously. I mean, they're very opposed to communism and I'm very in favor of communism, but I respect the work that they do around peaceful reunification of the Korean Peninsula. And I think that politics in the USA is rapidly shifting and changing and that we need to be able to talk to a lot of different forces we wouldn't normally talk to. Right. Um, that politics in America is getting weird. Who I mean, rage against the war machine. Who'd have thought Judge Napolitano, Tulsi Gabbard, now Tucker Carlson supporting you, Huru. Things are getting weird, you know. Um, and, you know, I mean, I never thought, you know, I'm really friendly with the LaRouche people. If you would asked me in 2011 when I was at Occupy Wall Street, if I would ever be going to LaRouche conferences, hanging out with LaRouche people. I've been to Daniel's house. I met his wife and kids. I never in a million years would have dreamed I would have been friendly with the LaRouche people. But here I am, you know, because politics has drastically changed and they are anti-imperialist and the left is not. And, you know, the world changes. And what what something means in one era is so different than what it might mean in another time. You know, you look at many organizations throughout history, the role that they play in one time is very different than the role that they play in another time. Um, you know, they, you know, and as politics twists and evolves and shifts and changes, different organizations start to play different roles. I am, we at the Center for Political Innovation, we're willing to work with anybody for the most part in order, you know, we want a united front, you know, um, you know, and we're willing to, to sit down with all kinds of different forces because we're serious about this. So, you know, I will say I, I would never join the Unification Church. Uh, their beliefs are just not mine, but I respect them. I respect them. Uh, they're they're great, kind, amazing people. And the fact that they have withstood everything that they that has been thrown at them makes me think that they they have something that that holds them together. There's some kind of spiritual power in the unification church. I, I'll just say that at risk of um, at risk of alienating some of my audience. I will just say that based on my experiences and interacting with them, there is some real spiritual power there. 
because the fact that they've withstood everything they've withstood, they're still around and they're still, you know, they still have a lot, a lot, you know, together. It says to me, there's something there. You know what I mean? Um, and, uh, you know, we need to pay attention to every, every illiberal force in this country to some degree or other, you know, um, So there you go. I mean, every liberal force we need to figure out, you know, so there you go. Unification Church and their agents made the Million Man March less political than it started out to be. Oh, I thought you, okay. I thought you and I talked about this once before, John, and I thought you were referring to something else. I didn't know that about the Million Man March. That's very interesting. I know that they had a friendship and still do to some degree have a friendship with the, the, the Nation of Islam and Minister Farrakhan. Didn't know that. All right, let's get to the next thing in the stream. All right. Um, um, you've answered the subway question in every stream. Liberals are looking for a gotcha. Yeah, they are, you know, and I mean, look, I, I have been canceled so many times, you know, and I have said what I've said about this, this stream, which is I've heard some accounts of the subway thing with Jordan Neely. I've heard some accounts of it. And if those accounts that I'm hearing are true, then they definitely need to arrest and imprison this guy for what he did. But that's not the same accounts that I've read. And I mean, I'm just telling you, I mean, as somebody who lives in New York City, has been here since long before the pandemic, has been here since the pandemic, I mean, things have really gone down the drain. And I have been in situations where the whole train car is terrified of the homeless person. And the homeless person is running through the car, spitting on people. And I, I have been in situations where people are very afraid. Okay. I have, and I mean, many times I have, you know, many times I've been walking out of the subway and had a homeless person shove me and try to get me to have a fist fight with them. And you just keep going. That's my advice to anybody. Just keep going. Right. This is New York city. No one's going to follow you, you know, but I, there have been many situations I've been in on the subway where there is a, a, a very obviously homeless person who has a, a psychological problem who makes everyone very afraid. Now they don't deserve the death penalty for that. So if this guy murdered a guy because of that, I mean, he deserves to go to jail for that, right? You don't deserve the death penalty for that, but I can very easily see there being a situation on a New York city subway where a homeless person is running through the car, spitting on people, shoving people or something. And somebody grabs him or something and it escalates to a scuffle and somebody gets hurt. You know, um, I can see that happening. And I mean, I would really not like to be in those circumstances, you know, and I'm a man, I'm an adult male. Imagine how women must feel, you know, imagine how, you know, older folks must feel. Imagine how Asian Americans feel as a result of all the hate crimes that have happened on the subways in the past three years, you know, um, you know, I mean, you know, and I've heard many different versions of this Jordan Neely story. And if some of these versions are true, then that means one thing. And if some of the versions are true, it means something else, you know, um, you know, but I'm not ready to jump on a bandwagon around the case. I'm just not. Um, and I, I especially because CNN is telling me to. And and it makes me when I see the left, the PSL and groups like that just jump on this because CNN does it and they want they want to have their signs on CNN. That just makes me angry because ultimately this is going to result in dividing people in New York. Look, some people in New York are going to support Jordan Neely and some people in New York are going to support the Marine. OK, that's just what's going to happen. And if you're of a certain group of people, you're going to support the Marine no matter what. And if you're of a certain group of people, you're going to support Jordan Neely, no matter what. And it's just going to be a polarizing thing. And I don't, that's not productive. This is an awful situation that happened. And it, it looks to me, look, I'm seeing a lot of things that, that point to this Marine overreacted. He probably didn't intend to kill this person, but he should, he had no right to put this guy in a headlock. You know, now his lawyers are going to make the case that he did have a right to put this guy in the headlock, but you know, we shall see. We shall see what facts come out. But as it looks right now, the guy, the Marine overreacted. He put somebody in a headlock he shouldn't have and, you know, killed him. And he needs to go to jail for that. Obviously, you can't do that. But I'm not having been in so many situations on the New York City subways. I'm not ready to just, you know, I'm just not, you know, um, you know, um, I'm just not ready to. I'm just not. So there you go. 
you know, but that said, you know, I, I'm not saying this, this Marine's definitely not a hero for killing this guy. And, you know, he may need to be jailed for it. Um, but I'm not ready. To, I, I'm not comfortable making this the new Trayvon Martin case. I'm just not ready for that because I've been in so many situations where, you know, we need more info. That's a good way of putting it. We need more info. And, and it's just, things have gotten so bad. And, you know, I'm just telling you, I have been in so many situations that could have gone this way where the entire train car is terrified of a homeless person. And there's a homeless person acting erratically and scaring you and, you know, and they don't deserve to die. And no one would be justified putting that person in a headlock and choking them to death. Okay. That wouldn't be the correct response. But, you know, I, I just, you know, some of the versions of the case I hear make me go, eh, but, but some of the versions, most of the versions of the case I'm hearing now indicate this Marine was clearly in the wrong. Um, but I just, I'm, you know, I'm just not ready to, I'm just not ready for, you know, I'm just tired of the left. The left has, you know, what they did with the Kyle Rittenhouse case. And now I really regret some of the things I said on these streams about Kyle Rittenhouse. I look back on it and I think, shit, you know. Like, you know, I, I should have just kept my mouth shut about this case. And, you know, maybe I should have kept my mouth. Maybe. I mean, I'm telling you just in real time what I think now, but there you go. All right. Um, thoughts on AI. Are more people lonely? I don't understand how the two correspond. I mean, artificial intelligence, it's computers doing jobs that usually require a thinking human being to do them. Um, that's that's what that refers to. Um you know, uh, how does that, what does that have to do with people being lonely uh, necessarily? I mean, chat GPT will talk to you, right? It's a, it'll, it's a computer will have a conversation with you. Is that what you mean, Gabby? Is that what you're getting at? I, I don't quite understand the connection between the two. AI shows that, you know, the computer revolution and, and the tendency of the falling rate of profits and the need for a planned economy so that, you know, uh, it doesn't lead to poverty. You know, that's what that shows to me. Um, but is, is AI a mechanism for leading to people not being lonely? Do people chat with GPT because they, they need somebody to talk to? Is that what's going on? I mean, I don't know. I mean, maybe. I don't know. I mean, why not get on chat roulette and talk to a person? You ever do chat roulette? You ever do chat roulette? I mean, do it at your own risk. I'll just tell you that much. Um, but there you go. There you go. Anyway, next question. I can tell you some funny stories about chat roulette sometime. Not going to do that on here tonight. Uh, hands off, you Uhuru chairman says Tucker Carlson was taken off the air for defending them. I did see that on the hands off Uhuru stream, which I tweeted out. And I think that is the truth. He went up against the FBI. I mean, it was probably one of many things that culminated in his firing. Uh, but that was probably a factor. And again, the fact that Tucker Carlson, the Fox News host, became what he became and ultimately got taken off the air for it. That's what I'm telling you about different forces playing different political roles. That's what I'm telling you. Like Tucker Carlson has done so many things over the years that sickened me. But now, you know, I, I, I see Tucker Carlson was the only guy on TV who was saying anything to question the establishment. And some of his segments were quite powerful. And then he stood up for Uhuru and now he's off the air. And this is why we can't, we just have to disconnect from the left, right thing. We're not part of that anymore. Because if you're part of that, if you're part of that, you're not supposed to care about Uhuru. You're not supposed to care about World War III with Russia. You're not supposed to care about Assange. You're just supposed to be, you know, chanting about Jordan Neely and and why anyone who is not on the bandwagon is racist and you're supposed to care about trans stuff. That's what all the leftist is right now. A leftist is a person who gets on the Internet, thinks all Trump supporters are Nazis, thinks all Trump supporters are racist and is obsessed with the five, the, the latest new way to be transgender and and calling anyone who doesn't agree with it racist. And. That's just not what that's just not the politics we have. We have no problem with trans people. We're obviously opposed to racism of any kind, but we don't hate Trump supporters. Trump supporters are more anti-establishment than leftists are. They're critical of the wars. They're critical of the FBI. Um, but there you go. Gabby, clarify. What do you mean about loneliness? Um, getting on my. What, what do you mean about loneliness? Can you clarify? I don't understand the connection between AI and loneliness. If you want to follow up, you don't have to super chat. You can just put it in the chat. I'll put it on the screen. I just, I don't, I want to answer your question. I want to answer your question, but I didn't understand about how AI and loneliness are connected. Um, so if you want to follow up, Gabby, I'll, I'll try to give you a better answer. There you go. 
Uh, the Cuban government ordered everyone to start their own garden. Absolutely, they did, right? Urban gardens was a big part of what they did. It was a very big part of what they did. Um, so, yeah, there you go. I mean, you know, and but it was forced on them. They didn't want to have to do that, right? And that there's some people who say Cuba is a great example of degrowth. No, that was forced on them. Cuba wants to have a booming economy. But in the 90s, they were forced by the special period and the economic isolation they endured you know, and that was a great point that was made by Fox Green is when people point to Cuba as as proof that degrowth is good. Cuba doesn't want to be that way. They want to grow. So there you go. Uh, comments on China's efforts to end the war in Ukraine. China can do it. China can do it. I mean, they're economically tied in with both parties um, and they can do it. Right. They are they are the force that can do it and they have the interest in doing it and they can do it. Um how would, and I'll just answer this other one. How would Trump end the war in Ukraine in 24 hours? I view that as Donald Trump basically just passively admitting, just passively admitting that the USA is pulling the strings in Ukraine. He would end the war in Ukraine in 24 hours by calling up Zelensky and saying, I'm the president, call it off. I recently saw a Snapchat of an AI friend trying to be there for us. Oh, that's so sad. That's so sad. And so many people need friends. You know, that's so sad. So sorry to hear that, Gabby. But yeah, Zelensky is just a puppet of the West. He doesn't have the power to really negotiate or do anything. He's just being used. He's just being controlled by the West. And I think Trump is passively admitting that. And he's saying, I would be the president and I would tell him, knock it off. And that would be that. I think that's really what all there is to that. So there you go. There you go. All right. Lee Camp describes capitalism as infinite wealth on a finite planet. Is that a good description? I don't know the context of him saying that. I don't agree. Um, you know, I believe that the whole point of socialism is to make sure that we have more growth. Capitalism holds back growth with the problem of overproduction and the tendency of the falling rate of profit. Please, though, don't don't stir shit up. Please. I'm asking you, don't run to somebody and be like, oh, my God, he said that. Don't do that. Don't do that. All right. That doesn't benefit anyone. I like Lee Camp. He does great work. You know, uh, I mean, he was at RT America and, you know, I, I like Lee and he's anti-imperialist. He's supporting Uhuru now. So, you know, like, you know, if Lee says something that goes against my worldview, you know, I hope he changes his mind, you know, but I'd like to get along with people. I generally would like to get along with people. That's my desire. Now, I have no illusion. I have learned that most of the socialist and communist groups are just going to hate me no matter what I do. So I'm not trying to please them, but I really... You know, I really, I lose a lot of sleep. I am so sick of trying to figure out who's mad at me now, right? And so it's just like, you know, Lee, you know, if Lee ever invited me on his show, I would go on in a heartbeat. I loved seeing him around the RT studio in the office. I loved going to his show. Um, you know, do you wake up the same time every day or sleep in? writing and you know like if lee doesn't agree with me on the growth degrowth thing you know i hope he changes his view i'd love to talk to him about it over coffee sometime over a diet coke but you know i'm just so tired of i can't keep track of all of them right is hinkle mad at me still is haas mad at me is i i can't keep track of it anymore i really can't peter coffin is my buddy he just made this amazing film summit against hypocrisy i hope you go see it um but, uh, you know, I just, I can't, right? Because it's just, you know, I mean, and, you know, I, I just, the pettiness and the, you know, they're all all mad at each other. And, you know, I, I just can't, I can't, I can't, you know? Um, you know, I, I just can't, I can't. And I just, I just have to focus on doing my, doing what I do and doing it well and building our own community of people that want to get along with us because I just, I can't. <sighs> all right. Um, but, you know, maybe I'll talk to Lee about that sometime. And if he ever wanted to have me on his show, I would do it in a heartbeat. How much of the crisis in U.S. politics is Bonapartism versus deep state and market chaos? Well, deep state and market chaos and Bonapartism walk hand in hand. Market chaos and the instability in the market leads to fights among the ruling class. And that leads to sections of the ruling class trying to utilize policing agencies and the military to seize control of the government and stabilize society. So all of those things you just mentioned all walk hand in hand. They're all part of the same thing. And I make that clear in chapter three of my book, Where is America Going? Bonapartism 
is market chaos leading to sections of the ruling class aligning with policing agencies and the military and trying to take control of the state and use it to stabilize capitalism. So all of those three, three things go together. They're not separate from each other. That's like, that's all three of them are connected. So there you go. There you go. Do you wake up the same time every day or sleep in? Well, I work from home. That gives me the ability to sleep in some days. I tend to get up early on Sundays and go to church. Um, some days I have to get up earlier for work. They need me earlier in the morning. But other days, uh, they don't need me as much. And so I'm able to sleep in. Um, I don't get up the same time every day. Um, I get up within the same framework every day, right? It's not the same time, but I, I don't sleep. I don't sleep later, you know, than I should. And it, you don't want your sleep schedule to get out of whack. Uh, you know, that can be very dangerous. If you're up till 4 a.m. every night and sleep until, you know, I mean, a lot of people who work from home get in a very bad sleep cycle. And that's why I, I'm trying not to do that. And I try to go out as much as I can, go into the city, go to the gym and exercise, stuff like that, um, because I don't want to get into that funk. Um, you know, I wasn't feeling too good this week. Uh, I went to the doctor. Um, the doctor said everything's fine. So I'll, I think it may have been stress related. I think I've been stressed about some personal stuff lately, uh, but I'm in fine shape. Uh, you know, my, my heart is doing fine. Um, my blood's doing fine. And so I'm doing fine. So just trying to get through life. Um, I'm really excited about our upcoming workshop. Really excited about this beautiful film. Go and watch Peter Coffin's amazing film. The amazing film that Peter Coffin made about the summit against hypocrisy. Absolutely beautiful film. Absolutely beautiful film. Um, you know, absolutely beautiful. Go and watch it. Link is down below in the chat. Link is also, you know, in the description. Go and watch it. Beautiful stuff. And, um, you know, it's really, really great. And uh, I'll be back. I'll be back, folks. Uh, it's been a great stream. I really enjoy streaming for all of you. I hope it was a wide-ranging conversation that answered a lot of your questions. So thanks, everybody. We'll be back. We'll be back. Surge. In the struggle against U.S. imperialism is now emerging throughout the world. Ever since World War II, U.S. imperialism and its followers have been continuously launching wars of aggression. But the people of various countries have been continuously waging revolutionary wars to defeat their aggression. And while the danger of a new world war still exists, and the people of all countries must get prepared, revolution is the main trend in the world today. everybody. 